All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the January 8th uh, meeting of the Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board. I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Rachel Zenberry. I'm the chair of the board, and I'd like the other members to please introduce themselves. Uh, Steve Rubelak, good evening. Eugene Benson. Shana Corman Houston. Ken Lau. And we also have uh, Claire Ricker, the director of the Department of Planning and Community Development, joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, the uh, first item on our agenda is the um, annual organizational meeting where we uh, elect a chairperson and vice chairperson of the board. So let's start with the vice chair. Are there any uh, nominations? Want to do it again? Sure. I would nominate Kim Lyle. Fantastic. Um, Kim, would you accept the nomination? Yes. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? All right. Um, you could take a vote. All those in favor of um, electing uh, Ken Lau to continue as vice chair of the board, we'll just take an aye versus <laughs> nay. Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstained? Okay. Um, and for the uh, chairperson, are there any uh, nominations for the chairperson of the board? I'd like to nominate Rachel. I accept. Are there any other nominations? All right. Uh, all those in favor of uh, myself continuing as chair of the board, we'll do aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. We will continue um, with myself as chair and Ken as vice chair of the redevelopment board. Thank you all. Um, let's move right into our next item, which is um, 882 to 892 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, Claire, do we have anyone from the development team joining us this evening? We do. Mr. Uh, John Murphy is here from the uh, development Great. team. Great. Thank you, John. If you wouldn't mind um, coming forward in case we have any questions. Any of the front seats would be perfect, just so that we can pick you up on the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, and so this is um, a discussion. Uh, we have not reopened the special permit yet, um, but we are uh, identifying, um, uh, we identified several items that deviated from the approved special permit. And uh, the request was made for uh, the development team to, to come in to speak about the uh, mitigation of those items. And I will turn it over to Director Ricker, who has been uh, communicating with the um, with the owner and the development team uh, to provide an update. Yep. Thank you. So, um, at, at the board's request, I have spoken um, with the architect, uh, which is Market Square Architects, which is a different architect than um, who had started the project. Um, and I've also spoken um, with uh, Mr. Murphy here, who is um, the uh, development consultant um, working with. Um, uh, the owner on the project about um, the issues that the board had brought up in the previous meeting. I think most significantly what we were looking at was um, the aluminum storefront um, at the windows. We were looking at um, the white accent, which uh, was not part of the original um, uh, renderings um, in the permitting uh, uh, phase of the project. And I think we were also we were looking at the um, exterior penetrations on the mass ave side uh, for the vents, uh, for the, the dryer vents um, that are currently uh, white. But um, uh, the uh, developer has uh, assured me that the white accents will be painted um, to match the building um, as the board requested. Um, the aluminum storefront, unfortunately, um, is, is unable to be painted. Um, at this time, um, and doesn't we, we uh, ultimately. It. Sorry. We can't paint it. Oh, just, you can't paint it's it. More weather sorry. Um, <laughs> there were concerns about painting um, the aluminum storefront that wasn't installed, um, and also, um, while the developer is uh, certainly willing to paint the dryer vents on the exterior um, the same color as the building. Um, there are uh, uh, some mitigating uh, factors that went into the decision to do those penetrations, which um, are part of the construction drawings. Um, and I've included a memo um, from uh, Sarah Suarez, the uh, assistant director, um, that went through the, at least the construction drawings and showed those penetrations 
um, as well as uh, there's also a memo in the packet from uh, Jim Feeney, who has been working with um, with the developer and the owner on the regulatory agreement with EOHLC um, and uh, answered some of those questions that we had about uh, location and size of affordable units. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's the introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I'd, um, uh, do you have any, John, do you have anything else to add before I turned over to the board for any questions on what was presented? Uh, well, the last one that wasn't mentioned was the signage. Yes. The last item. Um, the tenant in there is, is taking the lead on that because they're working on their signage. Mm -hmm. We know about the sign bylaws and you know, what goes into that, so we'll just assist them when they come to through the correct channels to make sure that that happens uh, Great. the right way. We just have their way. Appreciate the update. Um, <clears throat> I can provide a little just quick. Uh, color or background on a couple of these things, if it's helpful. Sure. Or, um, so the, the white trim boards, we did actually already start this. So if, you, if anyone drove by on the lot one side, it is underway. We have a room lunch on site, so any day that weather is permitted, we can do it. They've prepped a lot of the areas. Um, we're still trying to get back in touch with the cider to even find out. We will now honestly picked up on it. And we're just trying to figure out why that happened. Okay. But we are correct. Um, same with the storefront, that is more sensitive to temperature. We just can't paint it, we just, unlike the trim, which have to wait really until consistently over 50 degrees. Okay. Uh, so the affordable and the vents kind of play a little bit into the same thing. We really ended up with under 700 square feet. When, if you remember, we brought the building back off the property line, but didn't move the building back. If you remember, it was almost four years ago. And when we went to go build everything out, wall thicknesses and, and everything, we actually didn't even end up with a single unit in the whole building, over 700 square feet. They all range between basically 525 and 689. Um, and then, um, so the dryer vents, this was, I mean, to be completely upfront and honest, something that we never planned on or didn't plan on. You know, we were in front of you all. It was kind of just a, a rendering design when you go out do the full MEP sets and a couple of the things that kind of go into into the, that design. Every single unit's got two, it's all electric built. So every single unit's got two heads, two main splits, all of our line sets. We've, we packed as much as humanly possible in all of our walls. Um, we also have mitigation from an environmental um, issue way back with the, we have, we have um, certain vents the DEP permitted that sometimes you can do on the outside of the building, we pack them in our walls. It's kind of an extra just mitigation factor just in case. So those vents actually go up through the units and in our other rooms. You can't see them from the street. Uh, but those, that's one of the other factors that went in. And I guess when the professional uh, design was part of the building, that was the only place that they thought they could realistically go. And then we submitted our plans to the building department, and we know that they go through all the departments. And again, it wasn't something we were, you know, trying to do or not do. We just kind of assumed we didn't, didn't get any questions on anything, you know, at the time that we were, we were, good, we were good to go. So it wasn't something, I mean, to be honest, when we saw the dry events, we all were like, you know, oh. We weren't thinking about it, to be honest. Okay. That's it. Appreciate the update. Um, so let's take um, comments from the board uh, relative to the plans that have been presented, starting with Ken. Um, well, thank you for acknowledging the fact that uh, the white, I'm assuming that's plastic uh, uh, trim. PVC. PVC will be painted uh, per color. <coughs> The, uh, one of the major concerns I have is in with the, uh, the transition of the colors. When you transition, uh, say, from a, a certain color to an, an accent color or, or a different color, I've always transitioned it on the inside corner. I've never transitioned it on the outside corner. It's it's almost really hard to do. And it doesn't look. It makes the bill paper thin. When you transition, <coughs> excuse me. When you transition it from onto the outside corners, I mean into the inside corners, it looks like blocks or modules. 
And that's what he essentially showed us. In your rendering. <coughs> Excuse me for my um, cough up here. So I acknowledge the fact that you're going to paint uh, uh, the white strips uh, back to the original color. And you will paint uh, uh, the storefront uh, to its uh, darker color. Uh, I would suggest you submit that into the, uh, to the planning board. I just don't want regular paint, all right? Because uh, they'll just peel off and speckle in a couple of years, yeah. especially on, on aluminum. Okay. They did have to go get, uh, it has over a 10, 12 a year. It's a very special paint someone had to drive. Well, that's fine. Just, I just want you guys to submit that in yep. so we know you're using a high quality paint yep. uh, that's appropriate for the uh, store, storefronts. And then uh, with the panels. Sorry, before you leave that first comment, so you're also requesting, maybe even if you wanted to turn your laptop around, because I think that's really illustrative, you're looking at this area for them to paint to match. Yeah. Yeah. So, so can you turn that around so John can see that? I know we don't have it up on the screen. Oh, yeah. Come a little closer, John, or are you okay? No, I can see it. Okay. See how on the real, on the existing building, mm -hmm. you have it. Uh, the color changing right at the outside corner of the building. Yeah. And your rendering, which which is correct, which we should be that way, it turns that uh, the face color turns and goes into the inside corner. Yeah, I see what you're saying. See, so so it makes it look like a mass, like a volume. Okay, yeah. as opposed to the slivers, and that that does that makes a big difference mm -hmm. how the building looks. Claire, do you have the photo that the architect drew that? That submitted to you that was supposed to show what the final changes would be. I thought these were it. That would, no, that's from the very first rendering. But what he did was because it's even more. No, I don't have it up. I'm sorry. It, that wasn't part of the package that, no, it that we had. Anyways, it was what he did was is he looked at the old rendering, used the existing photo because it's more lifelike than a rendering, and redid the colors. I just I, I'll remember, I'll take a, make a note to go back and look at that transition to see. Yeah. And I apologize, I should have that drawing. To see if he did work that in or not, is my point. But I see what you're saying. I mean, if you see these volumes, when the color turns the corner and, and dies on the inside, it makes it look like a, like a solid massing. But when you do it the outside corner, especially that corner that there, corner especially. everybody sees going up and down Mass Ave. It's, it's, it's a pretty predominant elevation. Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, if you need, I mean, that's a big thing for me, okay? I mean, what I would say is we have the, the boom lift there as long as we need it, and now's the time to, you know, call these things out. And we can just fix no, it. but are these, is that EFIS or is it a... Uh, no, it's it's under the, um, a certain type of uh, cement board, porous, whatever. Um, there's like three or four different kinds. That you can so use. It's, it's a cement board? Yeah. So it can hold all of that. Okay, so you so yeah. using a uh, high quality cement, yeah. cementitious paint. Yes. That good. Okay, that's fine. That that will work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that would be uh, if you can give me that uh, that rendering. Yeah. The, the latest set of renderings or Claire, you can I'll will share it. Uh, I have no problem marking it up. Probably just to avoid it. Uh, just so there's no any confusion. Is that okay? I think that's fine, Ken. All right. So I don't mind marking up saying this is what it is, and I'll pass it along the rest of the board so they can take a look at it. So I'm, I'm, it's not just me. I'm just something that I've brought up that I, you know. Um, and then as far as um, the, the louvers uh, that you have uh, to the outside, some of them are dry vents and some of them are bathroom vents, right? I believe so, that's right. So those, the, so there's two uh, there the are exhausts and there's, is there one that's intake? Definitely make up there. looking at the, the plans. <coughs> there's a better chance than not that you're correct. They stick out right now a little bit, okay? And I think by painting them may not be uh, satisfactory to the board just to have them painted out. Um, uh, can I suggest that maybe you can bring some samples of different types of louvers that uh, that might be painted out to match? And I would bring, I would highly recommend bringing a sample of that louver in. So 
so we actually see it. And um, you know, I'm not trying to uh, nitpick everything here, but I'm just trying to find ways for you to get out of this situation here. These are, you know, purely my recommendations right now. Okay, I haven't talked to the board at all about this, and I'm not sure what their feelings are, but I'm saying that you know, if you can come up with something that looks nice, er, okay, now, I've seen intakes and exhausts where it's maybe round with little with cylindrical stuff in it, or if it's a, a flat panel that comes out straight and they, they just suck it from the side so it just looks like a recess or something that protrudes out. There's many ways of looking at this uh, as a, uh, or even as a custom thing, not leaving it the way it is right now. Uh, are there only the projects that the board has seen that they particularly like that they can use towards? Because there are many more than a few options here just in the spirit of being um, specific. Off the top of my head, I can't find. I, I don't. I can't think of one right now. I, I want as I see him, but I would go back and challenge your architect to look at exhaust louvers that go on existing multifamily buildings. I'm sure there's a handful of stuff that that he can find, and uh, submit those cuts and, and whatever you guys decide upon. As far as acceptable, I would order one, so we have it here. And that's all I have right now. Thank you, Ken. Gina. So, um, thank you, Ken. That was very thorough. I appreciate it. Um, and and I appreciate your efforts um, already to uh, to move fa uh, forward on mitigating these factors. That goes a long way coming in this evening. Um, were we preparing this evening to talk about some of the affordability questions, or were we going to set that aside for later? Uh, now would be, if there are any questions, I know that, um, Claire, you've spoken with Jim Feeney and obviously provided the memo for us, so Correct. if we were going to speak about that, tonight would be the time. Yep. So, so <clears throat> I was just hoping you could flesh out for me a little bit more, uh, what happened there. What, yeah, what happened? Um, in terms of which part we're asking. So, so I understand that, uh, as I understand it, um, there are some questions about uh, the appropriateness of the size of units as, um, re as relates to the other units in the building as well as, as, well as location of units. Could you talk about selection of units um, uh, why you think those units are appropriate and um, and what happened from the original approvals that got us to this point where, where um, the questions are arising at all. So I'd have to go back and look at the original uh, plans that got to get approved, but were they labeled on that? So I don't I believe they, they were, were labeled on the original plans. Um, I don't believe they can were. I, can I please, please do. I believe that they were labeled, yeah. but the sizes weren't indicated on the plan. But it almost doesn't matter because our decision said it has to meet the requirements of the bylaw for affordable housing, and. Um, they have to be dispersed throughout the building. So no matter where it was in the plans, that didn't matter because that's not, not what the decision was. And I think that was the point. Well, one, it sounds like no one, including anyone in the planning department at the time or the agency that is on some of the tenants list that we hired even knew about the 700 square foot rule. No one seemed to know about it, including, including ourselves. So in hindsight, that specific approval note, probably we couldn't have even had in there, obviously, just to cross that one off the list. Um, and then I think the original, weren't they even stacked originally? Which they aren't stacked now. I mean, they're dispersed across floors. They're across so, floors and locations. Right. So the, so they're across floors. That 
um, I'm comfortable with that. I would be surprised if no one flagged the 700 square feet. I understand that your units have shrunk. Um, uh, I more tip. I, I would more typically expect to see a range of unit sizes that reflected the range of unit sizes in the building as opposed to um, as opposed to one particular size. Um, I don't know I, I don't know if there's anything that you could do to mitigate the situation at this point. Are, are there people in the units? In one or two of them. Yes, and I will say there's none of them are de uh, deemed the smallest unit, but what not one is also deemed the biggest unit. Um, they're all kind of in the middle across floors, across locations. Um, and when this was being kind of moved around, one of them was actually requested by one of the people moving in because they liked the way the light came through the back of the building, um, to be honest. This is also why the state's kind of been involved with it and um, the town manager. So we're, we're kind of taking guidance from the state the agency and the town manager at this point, which was kind of supposed to be the point of hire, hi, being made to hire an agency the entire time because they're experts in this. Uh, there's a reason why that those exist. It's what they do all day, every day. Uh, and so I don't know much, much more I can say about that. Um, okay. Uh, but I think they are being deemed to be floating or something, so it's a matter that, of that's, 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 that's what Jim Feeney's so memo indicated. So that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> so, so I will leave it there for now. I appreciate that they're deemed to be floating. I do have concerns about, about the process, uh, but, um, but with people in the units, it's, I wouldn't want to ask people to move out of units they have already moved into. Um, so. Great. Uh, Jean. Yeah, just following up on the affordable housing piece, I should just remind mm -hmm. you, if you've forgotten, I was the one person on the board who voted no on issuing, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> on issuing the special permit for this project. On the affordable units, the, um, the special permit says the owner shall work with the Department of Planning and Community Development to comply with all the requirements of the zoning bylaw affordable housing requirements. And I know when this started, the staff was different yeah. at Planning and Community Development. What was the interaction with DPCD during the process that would meet the requirements of the special permit? Um, well, it's pretty simple. We reached out to them to get started and said, where do you recommend we start? We haven't dealt with this specifically in this town before. And they said, you should hire one of these couple agencies. We took the recommendation off that list, hired them, and we were told that they would also work with the town and guide us through that. And, and that was it? And that was it. Because you're supposed to hire, you know, hire them to shuttle you through the process of the state. Do you know if they had any more interactions with Department of Planning and Community Development? I don't. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to understand what that was. But I have no other questions other than that. Do you mind if I ask Please. one? Do you, do you recall what the agency was, what the company you hired was? I can look at it in my email. Okay. okay. Thank you. Steve. Yes. Um, so two, uh, I guess I've got two topics. Um, one is I was actually happy to see the, um, in Mr. Feeney's memo, the mention of floating units. Because I've read some of the uh, deed restrictions for other inclusionary units that have been permitted um, by this board. And they typically have something, a section about compliance uh, which says that if you know a, a, a tenant uh, no longer meets the income criteria, then the property owner is response has a response obligation 
to bring the unit back into conformance within a year, which to me sounds like either the tenant's got to make less money or the tenant has to move. So the fact that um, you know there is flexibility in the units um, where you could just, you know, if one falls out of compliance, you could allocate another one. Uh, that seems like a good thing. Um, I also agree with Mr. Lau regarding the uh, venting movers. Um, I, I know there are models that are sit flush against the building and are, have a smaller profile and something, I, I think something like that might be less, you know, might blend it a little better. That's all I have. Thank you, Steve. MCO Housing Services. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, my comment, I, I believe that my colleagues have already addressed all of the, the items. Um, just on the exterior penetrations, um, if we can't find something that is much less objectionable than what is currently there, then I think we're going to need to um, talk about building a chase in, in, inside the interior of, of the unit for, for those to, to vent. Um, I, again, to what Ken and Steve have suggested, if you can come back to us with something that is much less um, in keeping with what you would see, you know, in the facade facing of the back alley um, than what we would see on Mass Ave with regard to the shape and the um, the um, the distance that those those actually come off of the um, the vertical surface of the building. Um, I'm I'm open to seeing if you're able to come up with something that is um, much less obtrusive. Um, otherwise, again, this this was not shown in the rendering. It really detracts from the um, overall uh, look of the building significantly. <clears throat> and like I said, it, it looks like the side of a building that should be facing an alley with regard to those those louver penetrations and it, it's just not acceptable for for mass out so um again I'm, I'm open if we could set um you know whether it's the next meeting or the meeting after that which you know you and your architect feel that you can come back with a proposal um, but it's painting them alone is not going to be sufficient in my point of view do others I know that Steve and Ken and I have all expressed that that is our desire. Shana and Jean, do you have any other thoughts on the louvers? I agree with what's been said. Okay. Okay. So if that, if you're agreeable with that, okay. I just have one <clears throat> Please. Just, um, they do do work in other towns too. Do we know how we? With these, we got to this point because the plans did go through every department. They call these out and they say to me. So this, um, they were like never we were trying to be devious or anything. I'm more just saying we're sitting here thinking we're good to go because these went through every department, including the planning department. They are a significant visual element on the facade, and we approved a facade that did not show these vents and louvers. If there is a significant deviation, much like what we're calling out here, which are the paint colors and the louvers, which become a significant architectural element with the quantity that you have on this facade, then you are required to come back in front of the redevelopment board for a review of any modifications that are made to the facade. So that's the step that didn't happen. Okay. Um, anything else? It sounds like the follow-up that we have, just to be clear, um, uh, we will circulate a um, copy of the, um, the rendering that was recently prepared by the current architect um, so that Ken can mark that up to ensure that the um, paint transitions were more akin to what was shown in the approved rendering. Um, we'll also, um, you know, if, if you could let us know whether, again, it's the next meeting or, you know, the, the first meeting in February, I believe that those meeting dates are, <clears throat> let me give those to you, January 22nd, 
on February 5th. 5th. February 5th. If you could um, let Claire know which of those two meetings um, you would like to come back and discuss alternate um, vent and, and louver penetration options with us. We'll um, have you back on the agenda for that item. Um, and those are the two. And uh, in the future, we will see your um, tenants signage applications. And I, under yep. I appreciate and understand yep. that you're working with them on that. And I'll just say it would also speed up for which of those meetings if anyone does have any referred or suggestions from any of the projects. If someone declare, we can, because we're going to look at all options. But, sure. You know, we're not necessarily. If I can think of one, yeah. I will include just, with the returned uh, okay. marked up color uh, okay. thing with me, okay? Okay. Uh, please. Add one more request. Please. Uh, can you ask your architect to give me a sketch of model, please? No. I want to make that a requirement for all new projects mm -hmm. going forward. I just want to add it to our database. Yes. Okay, anything else? If they don't use SketchUp, would there be another one? Because I feel like they don't. If they use the... Um, they use Revit, guess, they can export it to SketchUp. export it to SketchUp, okay. okay. It's, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a simple thing to do. Um, I don't know how to do it, but it's a simple thing to do, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and if there's any question about it, they can they can reach out to the department. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in this evening. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Ab absolutely. We're going to take a brief um, couple-minute recess. All right, thank you for everyone for bearing with us while we took a short recess. We'll now move to agenda item number three, which um, consists of the citizen warrant articles. And I will turn it over to Director Ricker to um, let us know who, who we will be hearing from tonight. Sure, great. So tonight we're going to hear from um, the uh, a working group of the Affordable uh, Arlington Affordable Housing Trust, um, the Affordable Housing Overlay uh, Working Group. Um, we will also be hearing um, two uh, suggestions from uh, James Fleming, uh, who has submitted uh, and has uh, um, presentations related to uh, his uh, petition. Um, but I think we should uh, start with um, the affordable housing overlay presentation. And um, with us tonight is Karen Kelleher, who will be giving him. Um, I should also tell the board that I just um, emailed you all um, copies of these presentations. Um, if you'd like to follow along, but I also have it up here on the, on the screen. Great. Thank you so much, Hi. and welcome, Karen. We appreciate you coming this evening. Thank you very much for taking the time. Um, I am here as a representative of this working group. I also chair the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. This is actually a citizens' working group. I'll tell you who's on it and what we're structured this way in a minute. I have 13 slides. The first 10 are about why we need it, and I'm going to go real fast through them. I'd be glad to take your questions. I'll suggest we hold them until the end, because maybe they'll get answered. And then there's three slides about what we're proposing for the overlay. I'll go through those whatever speed you want to. Great. Thank you. Um, this is the Citizen Working Group, um, which includes people who essentially have some technical expertise, because we were looking to pull together this pretty complex uh, problem to solve, so we wanted to kind of get at it quickly. As you um, can see, Mr. Revelak is part of the working group because of his depth of knowledge on our zoning, board, on our zoning code. Erica Schwartz, who chairs the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Myself, I'm an affordable housing professional, as is Beth Elliott. Um, and Phil Tedesco, who also is on the trust, but is, uh, is actually representing the working group and not a member of it on a pro bono basis so that we could move on with him. Um, so that's the group. Uh, another lawyer from his firm is working with us. So why do we need this? There's some um, just basic facts about what kind of affordable housing we have in town that I wanted to share so that um, we can remind ourselves why we need to do this. We have about 700 units that are public housing. Those were built between 1940 and 1983, along with 146 units of public of uh, Section 8, which is privately owned, but has a similar uh, income level. Those are typically very low income people live in those properties. There's been times when our conversation here is like, we just need more of that, which was 
would be great, but the federal government does not subsidize the construction or long-term subsidy of projects like that anymore. So that's not really an option. We have the Housing Corporation of Arlington, which has created 150 units over a period of about 20 to 25 years. Um, they have additional projects in development that are expected to add at least 44 more affordable units, so they'll be increasing their contribution and they've stepped up their capacity. Uh, there are many things that this would make it easier for them to do what they do as well as attract additional affordable housing developers. And then we've gotten about 142 units from predominantly two tools, which are inclusionary zoning law, which requires 15% <coughs> affordability when you develop market rate multifamily housing of six units or more, and 40B, which I know has been a complicated um, topic in this town, but it is a way that we are increasing this number because 25, uh, 20 to 25% of all units in either in, in 40B projects are affordable. We don't need to subsidize those. Those are cost subsidized by the developers from the profit on the market rate units. So that's how we get, those two tools are how we get developers to pay for affordable housing. We won't get enough that way, but it's an important tool. The uh, Commonwealth passed a law in 1968 that requires every community to have 10% of their housing stock affordable. This is 40B, it's the number of the law. Um, it's what led to the permitting process that developers can use or that towns can proactively use to create affordable housing in their community. Arlington is currently at 6.37% 6, 6 according to the published subsidized housing uh, inventory. I didn't get a chance today to check with Claire whether we have additional units coming in, but uh, sometimes there's a process to add uh, units. But we're about 741 units shy of the 10% requirement. Uh, just helpful to see where we are against other communities. At least 75 other communities have met this requirement. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox and they're growing. Um, we have a local housing authority. We have those two laws I just talked about. We have passed the Community Preservation Act and we invest at least 10% of those dollars in affordable housing each year. It tends to be a little more, but not a third uh, at this point. We do have a community development corporation in town in the Housing uh, Corporation of Arlington, which is a huge asset. We have now an affordable housing trust fund, which is new, as you know. Uh, we passed accessory dwelling units recently, which creates one more option for lower cost housing, not capital A affordable housing, but um, more modest pricing potentially. We have passed a home rule petition to create a real estate transfer fee that would fund the affordable housing trust, which is critical to our long-term impact. Uh, that requires the legislature <coughs> act, and there is a discussion at the state level about that. There, I hope that we have the opportunity to get that passed on a statewide basis this year, or at least pass the home rule petitions that are in front of the legislature, but they have not seen fit to do that yet. And uh, we are hoping to bring to town meeting in the spring an affordable housing zoning overlay, which I'll tell you more specifically about. So the Affordable Housing Trust Fund created a five-year action plan uh, about a year ago now, and one of the primary strategies was to create more affordable housing because of the gaps in the the acute crisis that you know, we all know about. Um, number one action under that strategy, this is just the like, infographic that shows the whole strategy, is predictable permitting, right? Um, and so the next few slides come from some slides that the trust fund created about that strategy to help understand what it is, why we need predictable permitting and how it contributes to attracting developers who can leverage subsidies. Affordable housing is basically a math problem. Uh, by definition, affordable housing is housing that the market will never create because it costs too much to build and operate that housing for low-income people to be, uh, for, uh, to be supported by the rents that low-income people can afford to pay. When we did the action plan for the trust, we estimated forty to four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars of subsidies necessary for every rental unit. That seems extraordinarily high, but uh, this is the market we're in. Uh, there have been some Globe articles in the last two weeks that I think are pegging that number at, is it 650? 650. 650. And that may be the total cost to build, but um, at any rate, we don't have a lot of subsidy as a town. And so if we just subsidize affordable housing units ourselves, we will not get very far. There are two ways to subsidize affordable housing. One is to get developers to pay for it. I'm gonna talk about the one on the right first real quick. That's those two laws I just talked about. It's 40B and it's inclusionary zoning. We have not gotten a lot of affordable housing out of our inclusionary zoning law because we have not been permitting multifamily housing. 
even at 60 units, not much. We've got one to two units a year over the first 20 or so years we've had that law. MBTA communities is expected to advance that by allowing more multifamily housing in the districts where it is effective. Um, so we hope that that will unleash some of those smaller developments, a unit here, a unit there, two units here, two units there, but there won't be too many parcels that are larger that will be opened up for larger development in the MBTA community zones. So we need something else, and here's why. Before you go to that next slide, I'll just go back real quick. We want to leverage state and federal subsidies. Um, there are enormous amounts of subsidy that are awarded every year to other communities. We have only three times in history obtained these subsidies in Arlington. And those are the three pictures you saw at the beginning. You'll see them again at the end. Um, you can go to the next one because I'm going to show you. I didn't update this slide. I made it initially in 2022. In just the first eight months, there was $435 million awarded to 31 other communities. We didn't even have a proposal in front of the state. And many, many, many years, we have not had a proposal in front of the state. We do right now because the HCA has 10 Sunnyside going in in February, and hopefully that will get funded, if not this year, then in the next round. Um, the, their last project, though, Downing Square Broadway Initiative, I just want you to see the power of the state and federal subsidies. That project had 4% of, of the cost paid for by the town. 13% will be supported by, a, will be a mortgage loan that will be supported by the rents paid by tenants and the rest is state and federal subsidies. So you can see how critical it is to get this kind of leverage if we want to have a meaningful impact on the affordable housing creation. But, well, let's, let me follow my script here. Um, <laughs> we spoke to a dozen or two affordable housing developers, and you all have them on, amongst your ranks, but uh, I don't think we talked to Shana at the time, um, about what it would take for them to come to Arlington and build that kind of affordable housing using those resources. There were four answers, and it wasn't surprising at all. They need sites that are big enough for the size of project that DHCD will, you know, housing and livable communities will fund. That tends to be 35, 40 units and up. They really, these deals are complex enough that the, the costs of doing them do not, not justifiable on smaller deals, and the state just does not use these resources for smaller developments for the most part. Um, funding, that 4% is not necessarily representative. That's a very low contribution. That was a very, very good deal for the town. We need to put something in. We'll need to show that we're supportive of the project. Permits, which um, you know, 40B is really the only tool a developer has, um, other than a <coughs> process which can be long and uh, unpredictable. And so that permits is what we're trying to address with this bylaw. Um, and then, of course, alignment. The town speaking with one voice saying, this is important to us and this is what we want. And so we're trying to, at every turn, have all the bodies who really have a stake in affordable housing development, housing development, aligned. So this is the background. <coughs> What is the proposal? Let me slow down just a little bit. Um, what we're proposing, the working group is proposing, is an overlay that would apply throughout the town. So it's not to apply it to one neighborhood or one district and not others. But it would require a high percentage of deed restricted affordable housing and would allow some income mixing to promote housing diversity and inclusion. What that means is we're not asking or suggesting that you have to have 100% affordable housing to qualify, but you have to have a high percentage. We'll talk about specifically what that is. But the rest of the development can have moderate income housing, or it could have market rate housing, which would cost subsidize. It could create some income <coughs> and also create more inclusion by not segregating low income housing from all other kinds of housing. What makes it work are those developments with enough units to attract state and federal subsidies, and therefore, um, we need to have a transparent path to permitting buildings of that size. We did some back and forth with what parcels are there, how big do they have to be, how many units could you fit on parcels of what size, and sort of ballparked about a half an acre, or about 20,000 square feet as about the minimum size to create a development of like sort of smallest size that could get permitted. Um, and then sort of looked at where are those parcels throughout town. And there are, many in residential districts, but there are also many in commercial and industrial zones. Um, and so we need to talk about how this applies in those zones as well. Um, 
how will we think about different zoning districts? Our principle here is that we want to kind of treat every district the same in that there's an additional height that you can achieve in every district, but it's triggered off of the underlying district. Same would be true for setbacks. So I'll, I'll talk that through more specifically. Let's go back to affordability. Um, there is some room to go a little higher, a little lower here, but what we thought would be a good starting point would be to propose that at least 70% of the units have to be deed restricted to be available to people earning at or below 60% of area median income, which is a relatively low income level, but it is the income level that those subsidies I talked about require. So it aligns nicely with our goal of getting, getting state and federal money. 70%, um, as I said, could go a little up, a little down. No specific district. Two stories more than whatever is allowed under the existing zone is what is, is proposed. The minimum setbacks would be driven by the underlying setback, or if there happens to be a, a lot of um, non-conforming uses that are closer to the to the lot line, then you could have um, the average of the the prevailing lot line or setback. Excuse me. On parking, parking takes up very valuable lot. Um, uh, square footage and so we wanted to try to be as aggressive as is possible on parking would like to propose half a space per unit in residential districts with no parking minimum in commercial districts we understand that conversation about this is going to be important um, these numbers are not coming from nowhere and actually I think Steve is better at stating sort of the background on this but HCA has data from their affordable housing projects that show that about half a space per unit is what's required in their developments. We have data from market rate projects that are a little bit higher, and there seems to be a lower parking utilization in low-income projects because of a lower car uh, ownership rate. And then finally, we're very aware that our commercial and industrial districts have sort of potentially untapped potential um, that's very important to this board and to others to sort of leverage at, um, as much as possible. And we don't have a perfect solution for that, uh, to be completely honest. We know this conversation was had with uh, respect to MBTA communities. In this case, obviously, there's a higher top purpose here, a much higher amount of affordable housing. Um, we think it's probably doable to include, either may include or shall include one floor of commercial. Uh, or community space, and we can talk about that, but why I'm including community <coughs> space. Um, I, when I first talked about this with Claire, she said, the ARB's gonna want two floors. And I said, <laughs> okay, that's, at, which I understand and would love to see, um, but I'll, I'll ask you to turn to your colleague who's an affordable housing developer about whether that would be attractive or not, and whether it would undermine the purpose of attracting affordable housing developers, because financing that space is quite challenging. And if I'm a developer, I would point, I would just come back and say, where is the market? Show me the market for that. And the town can decide this is really important, but we might need to get creative with financial solutions as well that are taking some of that risk from a developer. It's common that a developer, an affordable housing developer doing commercial space will be asked by all their funders to, to master lease that space and guarantee the rent. Sometimes a third party does that um, because it's important to them. Sometimes a city or a housing authority will do that. So so um, those are sort of the preliminary assumptions for discussion and feedback. We would love to be able to get this to spring town meeting. We know that this is not a you know, quick and easy and, uh, conversation. We know there's a lot of support for affordable housing, but there's a reason it's not easy to create and it's you know, larger density can be a difficult conversation. This is the timeline we uh, are proposing to try to meet, which is we're here on January 8th speaking with you. The warrant closes at the end of the month. We would put, have a warrant um, article in. We would have at least two public forums um, over the next two months to talk with the public. First about why we need this, and second about what's proposed, maybe bring in some developers to talk about whether they would or wouldn't, how they would respond to this, um, whatever, wherever the conversation takes us. And then in February and March, obviously, you're gonna be doing what we do to prepare for town meeting, um, with town meeting opening up. That is what we have. I think the last slide just is welcome your questions. Look forward to your feedback about how we should proceed. Great. 
Thank you so much, and thank you for all of the work that's clearly gone into this. It's um, very thoughtfully laid out, and I really appreciate it. It's very much a group effort. Thank you. Um, Ken, why don't we start with you for any um, questions or comments you might have? <coughs> well, thank you again for uh, the amount of work you've done in this in the time. I'm going to ask you to do a little bit more. Of course you are. Um, Way back at the beginning of your, uh, your presentation, you're saying uh, that I would say 24 to 32 unit size building is the is the minimum for it to get uh, state and federal funding for. Okay, mm -hmm. with that 20 say 24 to 32 size building, what size footprint do you need? Have you guys figured that out yet? Did a little quick layout. You, you must have an architect on your. Uh, board there, right? Well, may I? The, the person on the working group who did the most work on that, I think, is Steve, or got the closest to looking at particular lots and what the building, how a building would lay out there. Yeah, and the it came out to be 20,000 feet, <coughs> which is probably comfortable. Uh, 15 could work occasionally, but it would be tight. And the approach, it's, this was less of a, a architect's model, but more taking, borrowing the approach from um, EOHLC's compliance model for MBTA communities where you basically look, look, are looking at parcel dimensions, you figure out a floor plate and you go up some number of stories with an assumption of, some assumptions of dwelling size. So right off, roughly about 20,000 square foot property lot, properties with a four to six story building with a um, 0.5 car count. Yes. So. With that 20,000 square foot parcel, have you guys identified how many parcels there are in, in our city? Yeah, and we have a map, which I haven't, I, I want to refine it a little bit. Okay, I think that'd be, that I, I would, I would yeah. love to uh, take a look at that and share that. Just so, what, what are we exactly looking at? Yeah. Are we, we talking about six properties or are we talking about 30 properties? Or? I think it's closer to 30, maybe 40. No, it's. I, I think it's. I think the number is quite a bit larger than that. Yeah. Okay. But. All right. I just want to get an understanding of that because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not you know these five ten thousand square foot pieces of property all over the place. That just no. that just won't happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's going to have to happen in, in some of the major corridors. It's going to happen <coughs> in parcels that are twenty five, maybe thirty thousand square feet. Yeah. I don't see that many of them, but there are. Okay. There's more than you might imagine. True, it turns but but, out. but at yeah. least we can understand where they are, what what, what it is, and what, what what kind of neighborhoods we're going to form based off of off of this off this change, because this is a pretty big change, yeah. and that's where you you're going to target your zoning toward. Yeah, uh, we'll be able to show you a map that lays out those parcels by residential versus business districts. That's so that's see. that would be very important for us to yeah. to understand, and I think I think. That will be a lot of questions asked from the town, yeah. saying, "Well, we, you know, and let's get it all <coughs> documented so there's, so there's no confusion, yeah. and uh, and uh, and the mayors don't say, hey, and I, I, I rather put right information out there than have misleading information out there.' Yeah. Um, you're also aware that we are taking um, some of our." Um, Areas that have been zoned R1, like cemeteries, playgrounds, and rezoning those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Potentially, but I don't think that's. Yes, that we're looking at that, okay? I, I want you guys to weigh in on that, okay? Because mm -hmm. that's going to affect a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's going to affect your percentage of affordable units versus market rate units. Because what do you count a cemetery that's, uh, that's R1? Mm -hmm. Is that affordable or is it? market rate you know I mean you have only so many affordable units and now if you get this whole cemetery which is big I'm just using that for, uh, for an example okay I'm not saying yeah okay. I'm, does that does that change your percentage and it changes where you go for it or I don't know I don't know what the answer is I'm, if I understand the question you're asking you're asking whether like the 10 percent of all of our units whether it changes when you rezone no. the parcels. No, ten percent. The ten percent is is um, is hard to achieve. Okay, but there's uh, mm -hmm. there's a clause uh, I believe in forty B called what safe harbor. Oh, it's the the land mass, land area max, the land area. Okay. Maximum. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I'm more addressing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I understand that. Okay. And we should look in that. I, I don't want to be, you know, hit by cyber. I'm not trying to. Yeah. I totally agree with you guys. Yeah. I look at points where we can say, hey, what can we, we should look at these things. Yeah. Now, then, much later, where you're going to get. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Okay. We, we, I'm happy to figure that out. I'm not I trying to. I don't know specifically what you're proposing for rezoning, but we'll, I'll we'll collaborate we'll, with we'll your get, colleague in mind. I think there's a map that was just sent out, which we can shoot okay. over to you, which is, yes. again, I don't know whether this board will be supportive of that moving forward this year the open space rezoning um but um we can show you what the group that from the department yeah. of planning community development has been looking at that is looking at I mean, for that you guys have had a consultant in the department that has done the calculations on the land area maximum and i'm, I'm probably going to end up just going back to you claire and saying you probably need to have those like there that's a very technical mm -hmm. yeah question that you're you don't want my answer because I'm sure it's very simple, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> no, but I think we should know about it and yeah. we should talk about yeah, it. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'd I mean, much rather talk about it here in this format at the beginning yeah. than the town hall. And I'm always hesitant to bring up the 10% and say where we are because we have a crisis. Yes. And I know people want to respond to it. So wherever we are in the 10% and whether we're required or not to develop more affordable housing. I think the, the community has been unim oh, I don't want to say that word, but we hear such a loud cry for affordable housing. I realize that's in the context of debates that are heated and where we're not putting this forward. So. Yes, but you, you know where I'm coming from now. Where, where there, this could, this could just uh, yeah. derail you. Um, and then your majority of the funding that you're trying to get is from the state yes. and federal. Uh, and, which, and the federal dollars come through the state, so it really all yes, comes from the state. Which I applaud you for. I wish I could take credit. But, but no, but <laughs> I think that's a soundable, that's, that's a very realistic approach, mm -hmm. okay? Where instead of people say we need more affordable housing and they, they just don't know where it comes from, um, you know, I have a lot more uh, encouragement when people say, well, we're going to get it this way and this way and this way, as opposed to we just need more of it. And that's all we need. I, I really am appreciative of that, what you've done there, saying, you know, and the fact is that you're not trying to pressurize the, uh, the private sector in doing all of it. Because they can't, and it won't. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I think that's all I have to say for now. Do you have any thoughts on parking? I support the parking. Um, I had actually, uh, at the MBTA, said, let's go down to zero. And, um, you know, I was uh, a smaller voice then. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I will, my voice will stay. Okay. Uh, so I, w I respect any minimum, <laughs> any reduction. Great. Thank you. Shana. Um, so I really appreciate your work on this. This is very exciting. It's a very important initiative. I'm so glad to see it. Um, I would first. I would encourage you to keep uh, step back from commercial requirements. Requirements for commercial space, as you alluded to, as I'm sure you know, it is very difficult to finance. Um, I generally think of um, commercial space as you, know, you cannot assume any revenue coming from commercial space, um, and it's just it is just lost. It's it's a waste of money um, if you're attempting to develop affordable housing. Uh, I think the option having the option for commercial space in commercial districts is a great idea, um, and. And um, thinking about robust community space, um, perhaps how, making community space that a developer would want to put in their in their development anyway available to the broader public. Um, that would that would be an uh, an option I would be open to. But a requirement 
for commercial spaces is something that makes me pretty uncomfortable. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, is sort of the interplay or difference from 40B and what makes, what would make this more attractive to a developer than just going the 40B route. Um, um, yeah, so I don't know if you have thoughts about that. The concept is that this is as a right, mm -hmm. um, and I haven't included anything in the presentation, but we have talked about having uh, some kind of design review like mm -hmm. public meetings um, so that there is some conversation with the community that the working group thought would be productive um, and yield a better result, but that this is not a potentially extensive process that 40B can be. It can also be, I mean, it is designed to be a comprehensive permitting process that is meant to be faster <coughs> than the other process that would typically uh, be required as we know when it is not um, supported uh, it can be a very very long arduous and costly unattractive process for developers so I think that is the predominant difference it is the community saying we are trying to build affordable housing here we want you to come here and build it and um, we are creating the pathway for you to be able to do it. But we have thought about what it means, we understand what we're asking of you, we're ready for it. But we do want you to enter into a conversation with us. Okay. Does that make sense? It does, and, and I, think, um, I think it would be uh, very useful to me uh, to see sort of fleshed out uh, the envisioned process, the envisioned permitting process um, that would make it streamlined and, and um, maybe even some thoughts around additional requests like fee waivers or you know uh, creative approaches that that are not uh, you know what I see here is largely dimensional <coughs> changes um, which are which are incredibly useful but um, but like what's what's the next step how do you how do you go and use it um, and that's that, that would be really helpful see. Thank you. Thank you. Jean. I would agree with my colleagues. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all the work that everyone did. I have, well, let me start with one simple question. The parking you're proposing for residential is a half space per unit, but in the commercial business district, zero. Why the difference between residential, which might be one lot off Mass Ave or Broadway, but not for commercial. I think the thinking there is that it's transit accessible if it's in those districts and therefore, you know, easier to rely on public transit, sort of a transit-oriented development strategy. Although, if you say, I've forgotten what the T's exact measurement is, mm -hmm. if you say a quarter mile from any T stop, mm -hmm. bus stop, it's going to expand quite a bit beyond simply the commercial yeah. district. So I think the demarcation they're making between commercial and residential is not the right mm -hmm. demarcation as far as that's concerned. <coughs> On the other hand, unlike my colleague, Mr. Lau, um, until the town allows um, overnight street parking, I won't be able to agree to no parking requirements. I think maybe for affordable housing, half a space per unit might be workable, but I think zero just goes against it, especially for ones <coughs> that are going to have some percentage of market rate housing. So I think that needs to be looked at again. Or go to the select board and convince them that we can do a lot more with affordable housing if they allow overnight on the street parking. So I think they're, it's my, uh, they're, the, place, they're the place to go. Um, I'm not sure about whether it makes sense to have the overlay in the industrial district, because we just have a couple small industrial districts. And I'm not really sure that it makes sense to put them there as opposed to 
what we hope to do, which is in to encourage more of that sort of development. And it's not a lot of space. On the other hand, I agree completely with Mr. Lau. We need to see which parcels they are, because that may make a difference in how we think and how we think about this and what makes sense. If any of them are open space parcels, that would raise another issue. I think that the um, proposal we got from parts of DPCD on open space zoning is great, and other parts of it I couldn't <coughs> possibly agree with for reasons we haven't had an opportunity to discuss yet. So, um, you know, I think those things will have to come together at some point. Um, I'm also interested in where the parcels are to understand how much of the B districts will lose, because my sort of general impression is that a lot of the larger parcels are in the business districts. Mm -hmm. And so if we lose them, what, do, what are we losing? And, mm -hmm. and how can we figure out what we're losing and gaining yeah. from those sorts of things? And do we rezone some other things business at the same time mm -hmm. to make it back? So I think we need, I think, more discussion mm -hmm. about that to understand because, yes, we all want more affordable housing. Yes, we all want more housing. But yes, we don't want to lose commercial development and commercial opportunities in town. And we don't want to lose open space. So how do we balance all of those things? And you've made a great case for the affordable housing. You haven't made any case for the balance, right? So I think that's going to be important. Um, I'm just wondering whether, well, we'll see what the parcels are, whether just putting the overlay on all of the large parcels instead of the entire town, because that has the advantage of sort of not having this behind the curtain, this is really what's going to get developed, and this is what is not. Mm -hmm. But this is where we think these can be developed, so these are the places that we're going to put the overlay mm -hmm. as compared to <coughs> just putting it over the entire town. I think it's worth thinking about doing that. Um, I do think there needs to be some level of review, I think, for comfort. We've just started thinking about how we're going to do site plan review for the MBTA communities, and it may be an appropriate review to use for these also because it's an as of right review, but it still allows a look at certain things that are important. So I think that would um, be helpful. And um, I'm not sure two public meetings is enough to get this to a town meeting. The MBTA Communities Working Group did a lot of work over a lot of months, a lot of public meetings. You're compressing the schedule a lot, and I just don't know whether this will be more successful if you roll out a longer public process and bring it to 2025 town meeting rather than trying to just fit in two yeah. things and then go to town meeting. I think it will be a much heavier lift under your timeline. Yeah, my only sort of pushback on that would be it's two specific tech meetings that are solely for discussion of this, but then followed by all of your public meetings and any other right. like public meetings. It's still, yeah. I understand, and yeah. you know, kind of, I don't know if it's enough. I, I wish we had three more or six more months, but we have what we have. This work started pretty much, you know, as soon as we kind of put the, the dust settled on MBTA communities. And um, we aren't coming in cold to this conversation. Right? Like we have been having this conversation about affordable housing, about the MBTA communities, about so on and so forth. So it's it's a it's a warmed up audience, if you will. The other thing is in the flood zones in town. Um, I think this either can't be in the flood zones, or the overlay will have to allow them to build up above the free board from a hundred year. I'd suggest more than 100 year storm event, like the year in 2050, so that um, they can actually build in a flood zone, or else 
maybe there are no parcels in the flood zone, so you don't have to worry about it. But if there are parcels in the flood zone, I, have, I think you have to think about you know, how to do that. Okay. I'm going to take that back to the group because I'm not having the right answer to that. But I'm really hoping that the otherwise applicable regulatory requirements kick in there. But I know you know what you're talking about. All right. Okay, Steve? I have five points written down. And okay. It's basically all in response to what my colleagues had said. Okay. <laughs> yes. um, so uh, regarding the the GLAM, uh, the general land area measurement in 40B, you know we're not assuming that uh, cemeteries or parks are going to be redeveloped as affordable housing. Um, yes, if some of those parcels were, we didn't really, you know, changing how changing the you know what's the, the sort of open space likes things that parcels that are you know in R1 districts will change the 40B land calculation. That was not part of our calculus. So it's it just never really entered the picture. Uh, with regard to the relationship between 40B, um, it's really, I think we're envisioning an alternative, per, it's, it's a different permitting pathway where, you know, Cambridge has an affordable housing overlay. They have a, you know, a, a process behind it. Um, the first year it was in existence, they put something like, they put over 300 units in the development pipeline. So it was, it was successful. But one of the things that, say, 40B would give you that this wouldn't is the ability to negotiate and request waivers. So this, you know, it, it's the rules of the rules and you're not, and you know, you um, aren't going to ask for, be, have the ability to ask for things to be waived. Um, regarding commercial, um, one of the interesting discussions we had was uh, about, um, you know, if there is a commercial space requirement, is that eligible for <coughs> HUD subs for subsidies? And the answer is generally no, unless it is a is it community service organization. Did I get the name right? I'm not sure. But basically, there's there are some um, businesses that have a role in serving the community can be subsidized by this stuff. Otherwise, um, you know, the builders got to pay for that out of their own pocket. Um, so. You know, if they're to the ex to, we were thinking commercial only, a commercial requirement only in business districts where commercial is allowed, but um, we would the one thing that we I think sort of settled on is, um, you know, a, wanting a definition that could include, you know, organizations that would be uh, commercial uses that would be eligible for a HUD subsidy. Communities uses. Community, yeah. Community uses, <clears throat> which not commercial. Just to be clear. Community uses, not commercial uses. Right, you're, that's what you're trying to say, right, Steve? That we wanted to leave room for community uses that could generate financing, because they're includable in basis um, so, for low-income housing tax. So Ar Arlington that's Eats that. is an example. It was one, it was one that we agreed was, would be an, was an example of this, where it's a food pantry. Um, it's, you know, it has a, what looks like a, a little grocery store on the, on the uh, on the bottom floor of 117 Broadway, but it is a kind of organization that would be, you know, it, it is a kind of use that would be eligible for, um, for HUD funding. Um, flood zone, I agree that we shouldn't be building in the, or, or what, what you said about freeboard is something we should do anyway. But, right, but we haven't. So this is an Thorndike option. Place, um, the, the, re in that development, all of the first floor elevations were sort of based on the 2070 uh, sea level rise storm surge 100 year event as Cambridge modeled, um, which, you know, they, they have elevations right in that, right, calculated right in that area, so it was convenient to use. And, um, yeah, and, and finally, uh, regarding the M regarding MBTA communities, one of the things that did came, aside from a lot of outreach that you know came from that process, um, one of the things that I remember hearing was that well, MBTA communities isn't an affordable housing proposal, and it, it and it's not. But this is sort of trying to be responsive to that desire for you know something that would create more. Um, you know, <coughs> Great. Thank That's you, Steve. List. Thank you. Um, I'll just provide a, a couple more, and then um, perhaps we can just have a discussion.
discussion uh, around the board if, if it's helpful around a couple different things. Um, so I, like Jean, also feel that I, I would not be able to support um, bringing parking down to zero until the town um, allows for overnight street parking. And you and I discussed that a little bit. And I think that that's something we've been talking about wanting to put a joint ARB select board meeting together. I think that that's a really important topic for us to discuss with the select board so that they understand how impactful that is for some of the work that we are collectively trying to do as a town. Um, so I can certainly um, continue to try and move that, that forward. Um, <clears throat> with regard to commercial use um, on the first floor, I think that is incredibly important if we include parcels in our business district, specifically because we have such small business districts and we have such a need in the community for well-developed commercial space. Um, so again, understanding where the parcels are, if, um, if we are able to exclude them primarily in the commercial, in the current business districts, um, that is one thing, but if there are, again, to, to Jean's question around, is this town-wide or is this an overlay for specific parcels? I think that's something that really could use some more study um, because I, I would definitely um, be in favor of either specifically and only a commercial use requirement for the first floor or a very tight definition of what community space could be because I do think that there are great community space op opportunities as long as they contribute to the activation of our um, of our pedestrian ways along those uh, specifically along Mass Ave and Broadway. I think there are two different objectives here and they can just need to find the intersection of them or really draft it for what the town wants and let the developer figure out if they can make that financeable. Right. We just need to make sure that we don't those things that make developers not take advantage of it. Right. I understand, right. And again, to, to I think Jean mentioned um, the word balance, or Shana, maybe that was you who, who mentioned balance. I think I think that balance piece is, is what's really important because again, I think we heard loud and clear from the business community mm -hmm. in addition to, you know, we fully understand and support the need for more affordable housing, but at the same time really need to support the business community in town as well. Um, I also think that um, we really need to understand what the proposed permitting process is. To your point as, as well, Jean, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with an as of right without specifically um, understanding what the review process would be, and I think that's especially given what we just looked at before, understanding um, when when um, things are developed with the mindset of being as economical as possible. Sometimes we end up with um, features on um, and configurations of the building that are less than desirable, and and I think that it's in all of our interest to make sure that these spaces are um, um, just as, as well well built and um, um, fit in with the um, with the context of the town just just as any other um, building in town um, and I you know also just you know ask the question around um, do we have the time to, to, to look at all of these things really comprehensively um, before spring town meeting I know that even with the year that we spent on MBTA communities, we had a lot of pushback on, should this take more time? And we felt really strongly that we had a very well presented public process. Um, and I, um, I, I just want to make sure that we have the time to look at questions like, should this be, you know, for the entire town or should this be for specific parcels? And um, the question around, commercial use on the first floor versus community use, the questions around parking. I, I just want to make sure we have the time and the right forums for that. There may be a pathway, and I appreciate in one of your slides that you started to lay out what that is, but that that's a question that I have as well. It's fair. 
couldn't possibly argue, but we figure we should start the conversation. And I really appreciate that as well. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. All very helpful. Great. Any other thoughts or Just questions from the board? One other thing on your timeline. If we don't get to see the main motion until just before it has to be filed, the town mm -hmm. meeting, it's going to be subject to what are we going to do with it yeah. if we don't like it? You know, so I think that timeline doesn't really, I think, give us enough time mm -hmm. to look at what you're going to present as the main motion, which is basically how you would alter the zoning bylaw mm -hmm. if we only have a very short period of time to, you, to deal with it. I think we need, need at least a month. Okay. I think. I mean, it's obviously a trade-off with public process, right, so right, we right. can plan to have it drafted mm -hmm. while we're doing the public process. That's why we have pro bono counsel on board. Right. Um, I, I hear you. We will try to yeah. balance those objectives as best we can. Can you have something else to say? Just, I just want to reiterate, coming up with that map sooner and later is the most critical. And for us to get a real <laughs> understanding of where you're thinking and what are the possibilities. <coughs> Everything else has been, will spin off of that. And I think the sooner you get that to us, uh, I think the more comfortable we can with your time schedule. I mean, I, I bring yeah, all, I all the arguments are really great. But until we get that map and see what you're actually really thinking of, mm -hmm. uh, it's you know it's very hard to uh, say, yeah, I think you can do it this year or no, because yeah. uh, we still don't know, you know, how big is it, how how encompassing this whole thing is. So we can get that to you pretty quickly. Great. That, Just need some like a few that'd be great. And yeah. And we can certainly make time on any of our happy to come back. meetings um, whenever you know you have something that you think would be worthwhile for us to meet together to review. Thank you. Great. Appreciate Thank it. you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Um, so next up we have James Fleming, who has two um, two potential warrant articles to discuss with the board. Welcome, Not just James. Also, Vince. Fantastic. Welcome. Hi. All right, um, Claire, did you have anything specifically that you wanted to intro with regard to these two <coughs> articles? No, um, I, uh, well, welcome to Jim and uh, Vince, um, and I have your uh, presentations here. I just, my, my only question is where do you want to begin? Um, home occupation so you can get out of here. Sure. All right, home occupations okay. it is. So if you um, would like to present this, and then uh, we'll provide feedback from the board, and then we'll go to the next one. Um, first, okay. Um, uh, very straightforwardly, it's a uh, accessory use at your house. Um, and you run from home, and there's restrictions on it. And it's usually just you. Next, please. Um, I look, took a look. If you go to the library, there are a bunch of old copies of what was then called the Arlington Directory, which is basically you know, yellow pages and listed all the businesses and where the address was and who was the person who ran them. And there's a lot of home-based businesses back then. Uh, um, some that are familiar, so there's a lot of contractors who run their business from home. Um, also a lot of sort of general life needs. The, the, one of the lists here is dressmakers, quite a long list. Um, my favorite, a dandruff shampoo manufacturer at home who would see you at her house, which seems a little bit maybe suspicious, but you know, still there. A um, bunch of miscellaneous home ventures and then things like professional services, the physician, lawyers, notaries, etc. Um, so there's a, this seems like there's a lot of at least historical precedent for having businesses be run from home. And we keep, at least today we can work from home a lot more often. So we're sort of continuing that trend. Next please. Um, so the thing that got me interested in this is that there's Arlington has a list of commercial vacancies and they publish the rent. And uh, if you are starting a business, it is a very risky proposition because you are signing a multi-year lease and paying on the order of thousands of dollars per month for a business you may not know is going to work out in the long run. Excuse me. Um, you may not know if you'll even get through that one lease. Um, so there's a lot of risk and you can negotiate. And th this is a hurdle that not many people will want to clear. Um, the other problem that we have, although Maybe it's not that much of a problem, is that there's not a lot of commercial real estate, and what is has to suit you and your business. So if you can't find a space that works for you, or the landlord doesn't want to negotiate, or whatever, you may not be able to find a match. 
Um, so what I'm thinking the opportunity here is, is that if you're at a stage of the business where you're experimenting, trying to figure it out, you can do some of it in your own home, figure out the nuts and bolts, make it work, and then you can start looking for that next step up. Next, please. Um, I took a look at some other towns in here. This is eight other nearby towns. Um, I looked at it from a bunch of different dimensions. Um, things like, are, does the town allow um, employees that don't live in the building? How many square feet do you, do you use for that, um, for the use? Um, what restrictions are there on the use, on any like externalities on neighbors, things like that? Um, can you sell things on the premises, um, use the town, and put um, uh, traffic limits on your business, things like that? And so what I looked at is there's some where a lot of towns have things in common, like use restrictions or on, um, on externalities. But there's a lot where Arlington is sort of on the more restrictive side that I don't necessarily know need to stick around. Though play the most <coughs> excuse me, obvious example, this is whether you can have a sign. So um, a bunch of other towns, Winchester was the most surprising to me is that you can have one sign that's not illuminated and it's like some small amount of square footage. Um, a lot of these towns allow you to have that, but Arlington doesn't, which I thought was a little bit strange. Um, next slide. Um, so I, I tried to take a look at this, say, where are we today? And based on the other towns that are out there, sort of like, what is a more flexible version of this look like? Um, and so I came up with this proposed before and after comparison in a bunch of these different dimensions. Um, very generally, making things either more specific, so for things like um, uh, externalities on neighbors, um, the town is a little bit either vague or non-specific on some things. Um, and so this was, the, some of these changes are just taking language that other towns have figured out how to use to be more specific in those restrictions and apply it. Um, or in some cases, it's allow a sign or allow you to sell things that you're making as part of your home based business um, where we don't today. Um, allow you to have um, more than one pupil for music if you're, a, if you're teaching at home and you're a music teacher. Um, allow you to have an office. Sorry. That's okay. Um, actually, th yeah, this, is, this is perfect, actually. Um, the next slide is great. I'm already on there. Um, so signs, um, one of them would be uh, a two, two square foot non-illuminated sign, which is what a bunch of other towns, they all have that exact same provision. Um, traffic is one of the ones where there's opportunity to be more specific. Lexington has a definition that says um, deliveries have to look like residential deliveries, so things like a FedEx truck or an Amazon package or whatever it is, something that comes out of a Sprinter van or something like that. Um, and a limit on the number of customer trips or deliveries per day. That 10 is arbitrary. It's basically just there to say, this isn't gonna be something where cars are rotating through constantly. Um, it's meant to, to put some sort of specificity on it. This is a thing we want to be aware of, at least, even if we don't know the exact right number. Next, please. Um, the next is the most obvious. Um, we were all breaking the law for the last three years by working from home because the town says that professionals cannot work from home. So no, <laughs> no architects who work from home, no lawyers who work from home, no nothing. It's, it's explicitly not allowed work from home use. Um, I think we can get rid of that because it's the least obnoxious job to anyone outside the house. Um, uh, and then the last one that's um, interesting is whether you can sell something that you make. So Arlington says no sale anywhere on the premises, and a couple other towns said you can sell things, you just can't basically import things. Import. You can't buy things and then resell really them like a store would. You're basically making something and then like a piece of you're making a table if you're a furniture maker, and then you bring someone in to look at it and then sell it. Like that's the kind of thing that um, that it would change to. Um, that one and the traffic one are a little bit probably more on the edgy side. And that's one more area I'm looking for very specific feedback on when you think about those two provisions. Um, I think that's the last slide, right? Yeah, that's the last one? Great. Um, Vince, any, any ideas, thoughts? Thanks. So my name is Vincent Baudouin, and I wanted to just add a couple of thoughts to what James has presented as a professional who sometimes works from home and whether or not I'm putting myself at legal exposure by saying that, I'm not sure. Um, and especially thinking about the trend, how a business is born or how, how, how a new business uh, might begin in the town of Arlington. Obviously we've had home occupations um, probably before any other type of occupation. Um, the pandemic has affected that and in probably increasing the number of people working from home. It sort of accelerated a shift that was already taking place. 
but going beyond someone just simply working on their laptop from home, um, how would a business start? A lawyer, an architect, uh, a contractor, or somebody baking cupcakes in their kitchen. Uh, it's very difficult for someone to go from zero to 100. Uh, you know, as an architect, can I go out and sign a three-year or five-year lease on a office space for <coughs> my first client? It seems like a risky thing to do. So, um, so a more measured way for me to be able to do that would be to start working from home. I could perhaps hire one employee, and once I've got some uh, revenue and my business is successful enough, I can go out and look for that office space. Um, I'll just add that, uh, and this is prior to the pandemic, um, approximately half of US businesses are home based. And so I think anything that we can do as a town to increase the flexibility and allow people to be starting businesses here in Arlington um, is really something that we should be shooting for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's start with Steve this time for any comments or thoughts. Yeah, I, I, um, I appreciate this and I <clears throat> agree that we, you know, there, I think there is more room to be flexible in what we allow as a home occupation. Um, to just give a, a simple example, my wife four years did finance and grants administration for one of the major research universities in the area. She also does the same thing for a nonprofit. Uh, it's volunteer work. It's volunteer on a volunteer basis, but it's still, you know, and it's different grant agent, different acronyms behind the granting agency. But um, you know, that's something that, that at least by my reading of our definition of home occupation, you know, it's you can't be doing it. And it's also the kind of thing where you know this this definitely doesn't contemplate working at home. Um, or telecommuting, and you know, it's also the kind of thing that's not. It's, it would be very difficult to enforce directly. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of a modernization. Great, thank you, Gene. Well, I guess I have a different uh, opinion of the zoning bylaw. I don't think it prohibits somebody from working at home and then going into the office every once in a while. Although I agree it could be rewritten to make it clearer than it is, but I don't think that's the intention and I don't think that, I know that's not how I read the bylaw right now. Um, <coughs> so when I used to teach planning and land use law, I used Arlington's zoning bylaw before it was rewritten as an example of how crazy figuring out accessory uses are and I put up a picture of my dentist's office, which was an old house, right? And I said, look, it says you can't do this. How can my dentist have an office here? It's the dentist, they're, you know, the receptionist, there are two dental hygienists. And about every other year, one of the students got the answer right. I bet it's in a business district. And it is because what we've done with the business districts is we've allowed people to have occupations in the business districts, to set up dental offices in the business districts, to set up um, um, doctor's offices in the business districts, and all sorts of other things. So it's not as if we've completely prohibited people from working out of homes. We've just said those homes have to be in the business districts in town. Um, I agree with Steve, it would be nice to update this a little bit. I don't know about selling things out of the house. For me, that is not updating, that's going backwards. Not that going backwards is wrong, necessarily, but I'm not sure that that makes a lot of sense. I don't know how you enforce the 10 cars per day. So you, you, you wouldn't? You wouldn't, and you couldn't, and I always have trouble about having a law that can't possibly be regulated or enforced in any way. And, um, and if you're very successful at selling, you can have a constant turnover of people coming into your place. So I'm not sure about that. Um, so I think it can be updated to make it clearer about um, P 
people being able to work out of their homes, maybe even have one other person who's not a resident work there. I think that makes sense. I don't know about most of the other things. I have to think it through a little more. Thanks, Jean. Gina. Um, I'm in agreement with my colleagues that I think the code as written could use some updating. Um, I, Jean, I think I disagree uh, about the, the sort of strength of the business district. What if you don't live in a business district, right? Um, that's, that's great for your dentist, but what about my husband? Um, um, so, so I do think we need to somehow address that, but the sentiment of home businesses that happen to be in the business district, I think, is, is the right one. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, and traffic was, was my other concern. I thought 10 cars, certainly, I was just arbitrary, but I was thinking of things like home daycares. You're going to have more than 10 car trips just to begin with, so. Home daycares are not a home business. It says they're right in the definition. <laughs> Yeah, there's no other. Let's not go there. Well, and there you have it. We went but, there a year or two. <laughs> so, um, in any event, I, I think parking, uh, driving, car, car trip regulations would be challenging um, to pin down an appropriate number, let alone enforce. Thank you. Kim? Uh, I would. On um, this last minute, you just wrote down what the limitations are, yes or no, but I think you got to really focus on the business and say, is the business allowed or not allowed as part of this chart you create here? Um, Do you need use restriction? No, the use allowance, not restriction. If you, if you want to say home businesses are allowed, yet they're not this. I mean, if someone wants to be a mechanic, and he turns his, uh, his one car garage into an auto body shop that does repairs on cars. And he's, he's, he works by himself, cars drive in out, one car at a time. Now, but he's working on, uh, it's an auto body shop in a, in a residential area. Do you want that or not? But is that, not, that's not a you? That's not, so let's It's own like, business. Maybe we're getting hung up on the language. So the, the town does restrict things by the type of use. So like you, you can't have like personal care stuff like barbershops or salons. So the town already says none of that. And that's going to be included in this? That That's that's already in there. I don't know if... It, does this overwrite that? That's no, no, oh, no, no, no. So, so See, that's the problem I don't know right now, okay? So let's, well, let's say somebody else wants to, uh, I don't know. I mean, the businesses you, you mentioned are fine you know, architect, engineer, or someone who does economic stuff, okay? Which is great, well, but not everybody's going to be doing that. You know, say, say someone wants to, uh, also becomes a sign company. He does little sign things by himself, you know, just big signs out of his garage, and it's just home, you know, startup. You know, he might just have a CNC cutter and cuts up the letters and do whatever they do, okay? I mean, do you want that sort of laying around your, uh, your neighbor's house and that kind of stuff? I don't know. I mean, I think we should, if there is limitations, let's include that. I, I'm confused with that, okay? Sure. So, so right now, there is nothing that says no auto mechanics. They're in the, the granted, I didn't include it because it's a long list, but in the noxious things restricted, it says things that you can't have anything that has flammable chemicals, explosives, things that make noise that are beyond what the bylaw allows, stuff like that. So that, it's sort of covered under that, but it, the, the current bylaw doesn't even say no auto mechanics. I realized that by this. But it's so, so challenging because we don't have the section that no. you're looking to change in the citation. No. So that's, okay. I think, the challenge that we're having right now. Yeah. Sure. Let's say someone wants uh, I don't know, start a school and uh, uh, I don't know, growing marijuana. Okay. I'm just picking it out top of my head, okay? Sure. And, you know, you're allowed, I don't know, three plants per, or six. I don't know the regulations because I don't care in that, but I'm just saying there is some sort of regulation. And they want to teach people that, how to grow home stuff. 
in that at least not a little school of that. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm just thinking out no, I, I, the way outside of the thing here. Okay, and I'm I'm, 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 <coughs> I'm just thinking you can you have to get more specific when you do this because I see when you bring this up, it's not clear enough right now for a lady. And in broad strokes. Would you, are you more comfortable with things being restricted by the externality they create on the neighborhood mm -hmm. or by being specific with the use? So for example, I could say no, nothing with explosive chemical, explosive flammable, et cetera. Or I could say insert list of auto body shop, gas station, et cetera, all the list of uses. <coughs> so I'm going to rely on Gene to words in fact. Uh, well, just, if I could just interrupt for a second. Mm -hmm. So generally around the country, Accessory uses are in bylaws are set up two ways. One way is these uses are allowed, and if they're not listed here, you can't do it. The other way is these uses are not allowed, and if they're not listed here, you can do them. So it's partially um, which way we want to go. Do we want to have a, a short list of what's permitted and then nothing else? is permitted, or do we want to have a long list of what's not permitted? And, you know, anything else is. I, I just have to say one of the other pictures that I would show my students is somebody like washing a car in his garage. And I said, could he do this? Could he like say, I'll do car detailing in my garage under this? And they can. Is that what I read this right now? So, I think, I think the answer is we could rethink this. It's going to take a lot of work to figure out how to do this. Do you just want to expand it a little bit so two people can work in a place and do personal service work? Or are you looking at a universal rewrite of this whole thing? Gotcha. I wasn't planning on making any changes to the restrictions on uses, except for saying architects and such are allowed. So this could be just so it's professional minor, services. Just, just like no, no, no. Whatever minor. the bylaw, not touching that sort of part of the bylaw at all. No, no. I'm saying so. This could just be as little as allowing professional services up to two people, something simple like that, and then we well, have, have a long to, list. Of you things. have a long list. I just no, no. But that list goes beyond that. Now we have producing goods and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. But on the use, on the restriction on uses, I wasn't planning on changing very much. Right, but that's counter to Jean's point around, right. is this just professional services? Because right. here we have producing goods, et cetera. Right. And I mean, I think the other thing to keep in mind, they make co-working spaces for a reason, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, I think, again, what this is also trying to solve. So um, is there a call for this in town? It's not, I don't know, Claire, do you get calls from people who are interested in small businesses in their home and wanting to understand how that works with the zoning pretty bylaws rarely. pretty rarely. Yeah. So again, I think, is this a solution in search of a problem? Oh no, there's, there's, no, pro there's no problem that I've identified. This is just an opportunity that I don't know if it's very well tracked. Well, right. So again, I just, just to step back, I think when we update the zoning bylaw, it's not a, it's not a, small thing, right? There, and we um, typically try and do so when there's a, a meaningful purpose behind it um, because, you know, it, it, it goes through this full process, it goes through the town meeting process, and I think um, to make sure that it's meaningful to the town meeting members that we're bringing this to, what's most important is that we demonstrate a, a need. And so, you know, sometimes that could be that the way that it's written, there's confusion that, you know, the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Redevelopment Board or the um, Department of Planning and Community Development sees. Sometimes it's um, because we are interpreting things differently. Sometimes it's a need just in how we're contemplating the, the, um, the way that we uh, want our town to, to function and what, what we need as a town, whether it's again, affordable housing versus commercial and some of the other things. So if there's a demonstrated need for this, I, I see a reason to, to bring this in front of town meeting. And so that, that would be helpful is if, if we're able to demonstrate a, a need 
then I could certainly support us taking the time to go through and and, and take a look at updating this. That's my personal opinion. If, if I may, I thought Jean put a nice um, bookend on the type of uh, activities that we're looking at because on, on the one hand, there's the architect or the lawyer who's working from home and whether or not that's technically legal or illegal, it's happening and nobody's gonna stop it from happening. So that's kind of, that's small potatoes in terms of what we're looking at. I don't think changing to allow professional uses is the most interesting to me. That, that's uh, truly a waste of time. And on, on, doing it anyways. Right. on the other end of the scale, talking about a business that's starting to sell enough that you're getting 10 visits a day or more, that's a business that's starting to become successful enough that it needs to go out and look for a commercial space to operate out of. Um, I think in between though, there's a lot of kind of home-based business. It might not be the kind of white collar activity that I'm, uh, you know, um, participating in, but it's, you know, it could be baking cupcakes, it could be uh, making clothing, or um, it could be any number of things that are being excluded from the town. And you know, I think there's 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 a lot of um, a lot of range of potential uses there that are either flying under the radar because they don't they are, are not willing to operate openly or they just can't happen in Arlington so people aren't doing them and I think we could have some uh, economic activity that's kind of you know not present right now if, and so what we're looking you know I think what we'd like to come back to the board with is a proposal that's a little bit more detailed in terms of the actual changes to the bylaw um, but all of this feedback is really helpful as we kind of think about, um, you know, do we regulate the use? Do we regulate the externality? Do we do we say we allow certain uses or we disallow certain others? Uh, we're not looking to really change the definition of a home occupation, but we're more looking to tweak and be more flexible about the scale of the home occupation. And, and again, I would just say, I would, I would want to see a demonstrated need. And this is where we have the fundamental disagreement. Because if, you're not, if, there is, if, if you if, want if, if there is the need. support, and again, that's what you're you're talking about, then you need to show a, a fundamental need. Even if if there is no need and this goes in and nothing happens, is that so bad? Yes, because then we've taken the time of town meeting and the redevelopment board for something that is not serving a need, which is what the bylaws are intended to, to, to do. Please. Uh, well, I want to get to also taxes. Mm -hmm. How does this affect, or how do you guys think this will affect taxes? Is the, it, it would be because now there's you got a business going there, but you're on a uh, residential tax rate. Is it going? Is there going to be a break for that? I mean, I know insurance-wise, it makes a, di a difference, unless you're registered, having a business there, and if your business causes a fire in your house, you're screwed. Sorry to fill up language, but okay. So generally, if you if you do run a small business there, you want to register it with the town, saying uh, with the clerk saying I have a small business there, I'm running professional service, and then you get your uh, tax ID, whatever that mm -hmm. that number is, okay. And then then you register with your insurance company, and then now you're you're insured. There's a whole bunch of all the things that I, I think I'd like you to go look into because I think. Just by that, it's not enough for me to uh, support it right now. Okay, I mean, I, I, I'm going to go back to you know what, what what kind of limitations you want. What if I put a 40-yard dumpster in my backyard and I become a transfer station, and I'll say anybody can come around and just dump trash in the dumpster there, and I'll just char charge about a uh, pickup truck, and uh, you know, I got a small business going. How does, how does taxing work in your market today? Well, My as, assumption is it's nothing, right? Essentially, we're not changing, you know, this is a zoning change. So it does not change anything about the way the town or the state or the federal government tax businesses or regulate businesses. So if the town wants to change the way that it treats businesses, home occupations, or otherwise, for tax purposes, it would have to go through a different board than the redevelopment. Like if you're a home architect today, like um, my assumption is the town doesn't even know you exist and doesn't even know to tax you. You can. You have to have a tax, tax. ID. Yeah, but, that, but not not a tax to the town. I, 
Yeah, I think I think we're getting the weeds. I think it. Yeah. I think it's a really important question that Ken asked, um, and something that we should have an answer for. If this is something that we're going to, I don't have the answer. Yeah, I have the question. Yeah. Any anything else for James on this? Vince? Hi. I think I'd be in favor of thinking about tweaking the um, definition of home occupation to make it clear what's allowed and maybe bring some things in that um, may or may not be allowed now. And then we would have to look at both the use table and that other part of that zoning bylaw to figure out how to mesh them, because we're going to have to mesh all three. But there are a lot of things that you can't do in your home. For example, you can't do commercial baking in your home, because you have to have a commercial kitchen and meet health standards. And so, you know, a lot of things, and one of, one of you mentioned cupcakes, you really can't do that <coughs> because you're going to be violating other laws. So, I'm not sure where we go other than, yeah, maybe somebody should be able to teach more than two music students at a time. You know, I mean, there are little things like that that I think might be worth looking at, but I'm not sure that's where you go. No, that is where we're going. That's that, that is. It's, it's the number of students, it's the number of employees, it's the square footage so, of the home, it's the sign. I think the sign is an important one. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very generally, there are other regulations around businesses for reasons that zoning doesn't really need to concern itself. I know, but like, that, but you like, know, like, getting back to what Rachel said, you know, there's no need to do it for somebody to set up a commercial kitchen in their house because that's not going to happen. Things like that. Sure. It's not meant to be specific to that, but it's meant to be more general and say, as long as you don't fall into this category of noxious uses, you know, you're fine. Maybe well, other regulations uh, at state the state level or the health code level, those things might restrict you in other ways to the point where you can't run out of your home, and that's okay. Yeah. It, may, it just may not work. Yeah, I think. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time too. I think sure, I think we're going to need to move on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and your second you want, you want item. You can't hold this inside on I mean, I guess you, you live in one of these things, so you can talk about it. Um, this is a very fun category called attached single family homes. Um, the only difference between, between it and a side by side duplex is that the property line runs right down the center, and you have a party wall agreement instead of a condominium. That's pretty much it. And the lots are smaller and such. We'll get into that. Um, the current state is that it's not actually allowed as a building type, but there is an exception carved out in a couple, in a couple of sections here for these five streets where they already existed for the bylaw rewrite in the 1970s. And this proposal is basically to just say, hey, these building types are allowed by right, so we can get rid of exceptions and make the bylaw a little bit clearer. Next, please. Um, the main thing is if you are trying to do, say, an addition, like a dormer on this house. Your house does not even show up in the use table for your zoning district. And your architect is going to be like, what the hell? Where is your house type? And it's going to be a mess for you. It's going to be confusing. Can I even do this renovation? Is my house not as legitimate as the rest of those in town, even though it looks very similar? Um, this second bullet is a little bit more um, aspirational, and maybe Steve can weigh in on this. Um, if you don't have a condominium agreement, it's much simpler in terms of legal ownership because the property you line divides the lot in half as well as the buildings. So it's very obvious what's yours and what's your neighbor's. And all you have to worry about is this party wall agreement that says, you know, I will maintain the side of the party wall and I won't puncture through it to your side, which condos already sort of have an agreement for that, but condos also have minutes and all these other things that you have to deal with. I don't know whether we we create them, but it's, it's there. Uh, next. Um, so the thinking is this currently only applies in R2 and up, and it would remain only in R2 and up. And the only thing we have to change is to put it in the use table and then make changes to the dimensional constraints for that use. So for example, the current bylaw says uh, your minimum lot size in R2 is 6,000 square feet. So that's for a side-by-side -side duplex. If you want to put the property line down the center of it, obviously you're going to have to cut that in half and make it 3,000 square feet to make it happen. But that would only apply for this single family attached, so you couldn't then couldn't go and build a duplex on a 3,000 square foot lot because that wouldn't be 
allowed under this use table. Um, and the other change that would have to happen is that if you have a party wall, that wall obviously has no setback because you're right on the property line. And that, again, would apply only for a single family attached home. Next. Oh, and we're done. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Ken. Uh, Take your time. Uh, well, no, it's not really a... Uh, I don't know what you're trying to do here. I'm trying to get rid of an exception in the bylaw that I think is stupid. It doesn't need to be there. And I don't know why it's in there in the first place. So... You're saying we have a townhome, a, a two-family, it's two-family, it looks like a two-family house on one piece of property. Is that it? It looks like a two-family home on a single piece of property, but it's actually two, two parcels, two parcels with the house is right on the dividing line, and the party wall is the property line. And each parcel has its own driveway, each parcel has its own rear yard, each run. Uh, you have an alley behind your house that's shared, right? Uh, they're asking about it. In any case, some, sometimes yes. Each house would have to satisfy the requirements for parking and setbacks and so forth. So, that one house on, let's say the house on the left, okay, I'm just going to go for the house on the left. Sure. Then. So that parcel is also 6,000 square feet. 3,000 square feet. So they, so both those houses are sharing the same lot then? No. To make it? No, they're two different lots legally. Okay, so they're non-conforming lots, and they're 3,000 no, square feet. No, the bylaw says they are conforming in the exception statement. The exception statement says if you are an attached single-family home on one of those five streets, you disregard this use table, and you treat the lot that both of the homes are as a building lot, and that lot has to meet the, the use table requirements. So the, the lot that both houses are on combined has to be 6,000 square feet, 60 feet of frontage, et cetera. But for your individual lot, your half of that equation, you just ignore the use table. It might be helpful to think of a 6,000 square foot lot. If that lot happens to be on Silk or Merrigan or any of the, these other streets, you can build on that 6,000 square foot lot. You can build a side by side duplex and keep it as one lot, or you can split it down the middle and make it attach single family. Anywhere else in town, in an R2, you'd only have the option to make a duplex, but you would have to keep it as one parcel, and so therefore condo agreement and so forth. And so it's a more complicated form of ownership. And what was your what your change? What would that do? It would just take the exceptional language out of the bylaw and put it in the use table as an actual use that's allowed. So it would say R two, and under R two there would be a line for attached single family minimum lot area three thousand square feet, and it would become a allowed use in R two and above. Have you talked to Mike Champa, the, uh, no. the building commissioner, about this and say, hey, is this an issue for him that when this happens, that he throws his hands up and say, I'm all, I'm all confused, I don't know what to do here, I don't know what codes to apply here. He must apply something there, right? Presumably. So... I'm not, I'm not thinking about Mike Champa. I'm thinking if you were a homeowner and you're trying to do something and you're looking at this file and you're saying, what the heck is going on? I call Mike Champa and say, hey, what can I do? I and mean, that's where you start any... Oh, no, that's not where I started. We did our renovation. You don't start with building services. You start with an architect. You start with building services. Oh, no, that's not what we do. Well, okay, that's okay. I, that's fine. That's what you do. <laughs> but let, let's, let's look, irregardless, okay? I'm not going to go to that point there, okay? But I don't know. I, I, I'm a little still confused about what you're trying to do here. And... I'm going to go back to what Rachel said. I'm not sure what, why we need this. Uh, if no one's complaining about this law that's confusing or not confusing, or this exception is causing havoc to someone else is doing something, if it hasn't been done, it has not been an issue at all, and that's why I would ask Mike Champa, say, hey, look, what do you do when this comes up? Do you just throw your hands up and say, no, we can't do anything here? Because it's, it's, you can't do anything. It doesn't apply anywhere. Or here's what I do. So then I don't think this is required. Or I, I think you'd ask that question. So, Gina, I have nothing to add. Jean. So my understanding is these are exceptions, and you can find them in the zoning bylaws. So there's no question about them because they existed a long time ago, 
And when the zoning bylaw was written, it was like, what are we going to do with these? And it basically says, if the deeds were prior to August 28, 1975, you can do this. Now, if you get rid of that and put this is an allowed use in the bylaw, it would allow somebody, right, to buy a 6,000 square foot lot, house on it or not, get rid of the house if it is, split the lot into two, 3,000, and put these side by side houses on it. So this is not simply to get rid of an exception for these houses, because there's no need to do that if that's what all it's for. It's very clear in the bylaw that there are exceptions and why. It's to allow in the R2 and upper zones, instead of 6,000 square feet and one house, it's to allow 3,000 square feet and two houses that are connected okay. by a common wall. Is that your intention? Uh, you could do it. I don't know if anyone will actually do it. But it was that your intention. No, it wasn't my intention. Then we don't need it, then. <laughs> because that's, that's the only reason to do it, to allow that type of building to start being constructed. It's possible that someone could do it. I don't know what they would. Well, do you mean it's not your intention personally? Personally? No, because personally, it's not my intention the, to, to, to do it. It seems like the Warren article, not to speak for you, but it seems like the Warren article is trying to make that something of a possible template. Well, that's my question. It, this would make it possible yes. townwide. It would be a major change throughout it, all the residential districts, right? Well, of course, it, instead of whatever would, size lot you have now, you could split it in half and put these two houses on. I'm just pointing that out. Is that different than a duplex without the property line down the center? Sure it is. From the street? It should look the you same, right? You get 6,000 square feet. It's, the same it's, not, it's not so much a change in density, it's just a change in the type of ownership structure right, right. that would be allowed. Sure. Yeah. That seems fine to me. Yeah. Right. Steve? So I, I happen to all you know, disclosure, I happen to live in one of these. Uh, I own one. <laughs> um, I actually like it as a as it's worked out well as an ownership model. Um, mm -hmm. in terms of there are some you know, some things that span both dwellings, like replacing a roof, but I'm fortunate enough that you know, the, the person on the other half of the duplex, uh, or with the adjoining single family attached home, has been amenable to that. Um, you know, from the street, Sunnyside Avenue, where I live, um, has a whole row of these, with the exception of one building, which was actually recombined to be a, a two-family or to be a duplex on a 6,000 square foot lot. Now, one of the, one of the things that's sort of interesting is, you know, one one of the things that's interesting if you look at land value, the 3,000. So we have one prop property on the street where it's a 6,000 square foot lot. We have a lot of others where there are 3,000 square foot lots. The two threes assess out at a much higher value than the single six. Believe it. I don't know why. No, I, I've talk, I talked to the assessor, and he had mentioned that they assess smaller lots at a, high, a higher value per square foot. Something something about a fair valuation, which mm -hmm. I don't understand, but sure. So then maybe, maybe a reason to do this is that there's a potential for higher property valuations in town, which means more tax base if you do this. But yeah, in terms of, I mean, I, I don't see this resulting in different types of buildings being built, um, but, you know, so like given a duplex and what would a single family attached on a duplex on six versus a pair of single family attached on a pair of threes, I, I don't. I think the you know the buildings would be, would look the same, but it is a different ownership model. That's that's really the main difference. Sure. I don't have anything else to add. Anything no. further? No. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, that closes agenda item number three, citizen warrant articles, and we'll move now to the redevelopment board warrant articles. Um, Claire, and I will turn it over to you. It looks like there is, before I do, it looks like there is um, some additional reference material for the open space rezoning. There is. Um, the board had asked uh, David Morgan, who is the environmental planner, for a map of um, open spaces that he 
uh, when he came and gave his presentation um, before the holiday um, to discuss the potential for um, rezoning open spaces in town that are currently, um, excuse me, that are currently zoned residential um, and go and do a comprehensive rezoning of um, you know, parcels that are not um, that are not zoned open space, but that are functionally open space. And so this board asked him to, to please come back with a map and a list of the parcels um, under consideration, and he was um, happy to provide that. Thank you, Claire. Um, I had just gone through my notes before the meeting tonight, um, and, and I believe that we'd identified that um, there there were quite a few decision trees that still needed to be gone through for the open space article before it could come before town meeting. And we had identified that we should designate somebody from the board to work together with with David on bringing this forward. So did you say you would raise? I don't know that we identify the person. Um, is anyone else interested, or are we in support of Jean reaching out to David to move forward on this one? But I don't think we're going to get it done for this year's time. No, I think we were pretty unanimous in that. I would agree. I, this was um, provided as, as the board requested it, and David wanted to make sure that. Really we appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Yes. And Fantastic. Can I just say one of the things that I said when this came up, I'll say it again, is some of these I think might be appropriate to be open space. But some, like cemeteries, we should think about having a cemetery zoning instead. And some of them that are um, town properties but aren't really open space might be a, a new type of zoning called like public space zone. Right. You know, so I've looked a little bit, and there are ways there are ways to do this that make sense. Some of them that we listed have what's known as Article 97 protection, and I think those are the most likely to fall into the open space yeah. category, but I just want to say that's my thinking going in to the meeting with David. Right. And I think the other thing that we identified from the meeting too, much like when we looked at things like MBTA communities and other items across the town in terms of these are the parcels today so that we don't do the same thing we did in the 70s and just zone what's on the lot today. Are there other spaces that could or should be open space in the future? Are there some of these that perhaps don't serve the community as well as open space, you know, today? You know, sh would we want to expand the opportunity? You know, I, I think that, that those are all things we brought up, yeah. Um, Great. I have uh, one more um, slide I wanted to bring up, and this right here is a list of the likely ARB warrant articles for the spring. Um, we had talked about the for 2024. Correct. This one. Excuse me. This is. They know we're also tracking a few for 2025 <laughs> now, so I just want to make sure that we. This is a typo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the uh, elimination of the inland wetland district, which is supported by at least four town departments, um, as well as the ZBA. Um, the revision of section uh, 53.19, the reduced height buffer um, from the ZBA, the clarification of definitions of attached and detached, um, elimination or clarification of section 5.3.10 to distinguish between vacant and non-vacant properties, um, elimination of bullets um, at each point uh, labeled with a letter or a number, we have talked about that potentially even going on a consent agenda or a recommendation for a consent agenda. Um, and then amending section 5.9.2.b1, both five, which should be number five, to clarify whether or not new ADUs might be constructed within six feet of the property line with a special permit. My question to the board is, do you think I have, or we have uh, missed anything? Is there something else um, the board wishes to uh, progress to town meeting in 2024? I'm looking through here. Um, we had looked at, Jean, were you looking at this one? The um, residential provisions for TDM? We had, we had talked about it, we but talked. we didn't put it on any sort of track to get done. Okay, 
So that might be a 2025. Okay. Yeah, I think we would need help from the transportation okay. plan. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going through. I have a long list here. Just Steve going through. One. Steve. No, that was, um, that was that was that was it. Okay. And I, I had mentioned to Rachel that um, Christian Klein and Pat Hamlin and Mike Champ and I met last week, right. and we have a follow up on some of those on the list, which I can talk about. That'd be great. Christian, you want to help or you want to just sit there? So I'll, I'll do my thing and you can time it. So on um, the definition of attached and detached in the zoning bylaw, we came to agreement about um, changing the definition of attached and changing the definition of detached. And I've done a draft. This is only a draft, um, which I shared with the folks who are at the meeting. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um, I mean, for the for the meeting perspective, that it was a very productive meeting. I think we had a lot of uh, good sit down with with uh, Dirk Champa and um, Pat Hanlon, and Gene, and myself. Um, as far as the attached and detached, the the basic premise is that the terms sound like they ought to be in opposition, but they're not because there's a gap in our the way that they're defined, and uh, we worked out sort of a, a change in the language which um, Gene has drafted here. And essentially what it does is the, the current definition of attached is it's attached if that has a wall in common. And it's detached if there's <coughs> nothing in connection. <coughs> so we're modifying it so that it's either a wall or a roof in combination would make it attached. And that if it does not meet that, then it is detached. So that there is a clear delineation between the two. So sorry, a wall and a roof in combination, not an either or. No, either or. Either or. Yep. Okay. A wall, a roof, or a wall and roof. That's Got one it. Question. Oh, That's yes. one question on that. Yeah. How much of a roof attachment? <laughs> you know where I'm yeah. going. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've had lots of questions about this. Um, I, if if they come into contact with each other, the, the build, you know, it's basically the this, this genesis of this was the question about the house and the garage. If you build a covered breezeway between the two, are they attached? Correct. And by the current definition, they're not. Okay. Um, the building department does consider that attached. I know that. And so That's where the we wanted to make sure that we were capturing that. Um, but if you have you know, if you have your garage and your house and you have a sort of a you know wall that runs between them and it just you know is contacts the, you know, the just the, the thickness of the wall that would still be considered attached um, are we going to put a number on this uh, what i'm thinking of is <coughs> all of a sudden i have a uh, house a garage and i just put a little covered breezeway between the yep. All right, and it's only maybe four foot wide, okay? Mm -hmm. and now it's considered attached yes. to, the, going to the building department. Yep. Okay? Do you guys think it's, it's called attached or detached based on your revisions there? By the, by the proposed definition, that would absolutely be attached. Okay. So all you need is any attached, any touchment, any... As long as it's a wall or a roof. Like, because the, the other question was if you had a deck that spanned between the two, would the deck cause them to be attached. And we sort of haggled back and forth on that and decided in the end that that was not sufficient enough to justify considering them as attached. Say you, let's say you have a house. Yep. And you have a garage. And the corners touch. Mm -hmm. Is that attached? That's attached. Because a foot of it attaches because they just... It's attached today. It'll be attached tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. I just want to... Yeah, absolutely. So any attachment so it's not based on square footage it's not based on uh, percentage of attachment it's just any attachment mm -hmm. so if there's an existing roof across it two feet wide three feet wide that you can walk under yep. it's attached if the corners of the building are touching it's attached, it's attached. okay so that's where 
go to that and we're all clear. Okay. Okay, so um, section 5.3.10, according to, this is the one about uh, vacant lot, non-vacant lot. According to uh, my Champa, the way it's been interpreted is if the building is removed and the foundation is removed, it becomes a vacant lot. And at that point, you can take advantage, if you want, of the different setback, the average on the street. And after lots of discussion, we felt like if that's the interpretation, that's fine. And we don't need to change the zoning model. So that one comes off now. Yeah. So, so that one off. comes okay. off. Then um, the bullets we'll, to numbers. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll do the bullets to numbers. And as long as we did the bullets to numbers, on the copy I gave you, Claire, there's another provision in there that can be deleted because it was just there for the first year the bylaw was in effect. And that's more than that. So change the bullets to numbers. And then we will just put a little reference in um, 5.4.2a to s s reference the other exception. Although technically it's not needed mm -hmm. because if you look at um, 5.9.2b, it says notwithstanding anything else, this is how it works. So it's sort of a belt and suspenders to just add that. So we ended up with just um, the um, um, the redefinitions of building attached and building detached. Um, we ended up just adding the other exception um, in 5.4.2a, and we ended up um, um, changing the bullets to letters and getting rid of the one section that's no longer needed because it was only for the first year the bylaw was in effect. And, and by the way, if you look through the bylaw like I did, you'll find there's no standard method to go from big A to one to small A. <laughs> so, so I just chose the most nearby ones and okay. used the same, same way to do it. And I'll send that around to everyone. I just got it done today. Right. And then we had said that, again, all of the residential parking requirements in terms of that, that would be in 2025. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to move that to my 2025 section now. Oops. All right. And that's it. Perfect. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so all. much, Christian. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for meeting with them, too. All right. Good. Okay, so our next steps, which is our next agenda item, Correct. right, <laughs> um, is the schedule of moving forward towards, first of all, the submission. Um, I think we'll need to, at our next meeting, just review the language that will be submitted for the warrant articles. Correct. Um, and um, we should identify if there are one or two members of the board, um, and I certainly, you know, like we did for Fall town meeting, fall town Jean and I can certainly raise our hands to support. Um, you know, if you wanted to do the initial draft or if Absolutely. you want us to do I, I did the draft. Jean has already the done three. the draft here. That, that my, my one, um, the reduced height buffer, do we have um, draft language related to that? that Jean, you had suggested. A, Separate I don't know. language. I have, I have to look and see. Okay. Because mm -hmm. we, we well, figured we, out which section we needed to we, update right, and it was incorrect before. But we didn't update it. So I'll look and see what I have. Thank you. Yeah, Great. I don't remember. I may not vote for it, but I can find <laughs> it. <laughs> Come on, Gene. <laughs> oh, Gene. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. Um, so just quickly, the spring 24 town meeting. Not 25. Yes. Um, so on the 22nd, we will um, review our final uh, warrant articles. At least the ARB intends to forward. Um, the, the, we can finalize the language um, for the 26th when the warrant closes. Um, the earliest we can start our public hearings um, for uh, uh, for town meeting um, is on the 4th of March because of our. Um, 
legal notification request. <coughs> um, we also have a meeting on um, March 18th that we could potentially extend to, but it seems to me like we are only really looking at about seven um, amendments, including citizen petition that may um, be brought forward if the three that we heard tonight um, are uh, eventually progressed. Okay. I mean, there, there may be other things that are on our radar, too. So sure. I think perhaps if we plan for this, it might not be a bad idea to identify um, a backup additional yep. night just in case we need it. And Absolutely. then we'll also need a night to for the vote right. and um, a night to uh, review and approve the report. So our April meetings, That'll move us into April. right? Our April meetings. I know those moved a bit. So we had April first, the first and the eighth, and the eighth. So I don't know the date that they need to receive the report by. That's probably something that Julie and um, Greg have identified or maybe perhaps not yet, but that's something that I think, you know, in the past we've had to add, you know, a quick Wednesday or something like that Correct. just to review that. So I think if we can work that out a little bit further okay. in terms of this, this is a great start, but I think we may need to just work it out a little bit further to get through all of the required. The so at our meeting on the 22nd, I will propose um, a schedule um, like potentially like you've seen in the year in years past that yeah. go over the with an optional depending on again how many citizen day. petitions okay. we have. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sure. Perfect. And then the yeah. meeting starts is it the twenty ninth? I heard the twenty second, but I'm not sure that that is I think it's still a little up in the air. Up in February? No. April. Yeah. Town meeting. Hmm. Okay. I think that's Passover. I, I thought what the town moderator had said is that the bylaw. That's right, they're still trying to figure it out. requires that it start on that date. But, but it's, it's Passover. But it's a holiday, so yeah. he may just open the meeting and then adjourn the meeting okay. and have it officially that's right. start two days later. At least the 24th. Right, at least okay. that's the current thing. Okay, fantastic. Great. Thank you, Jean, for your memory. <laughs> I knew we'd gotten an email about it. I couldn't remember what it was. Okay, uh, so that closes agenda item number five, unless there are any other um, discussion points around the warrant article hearing. Jean. This is, this is another hearing we're going to have to fit in. Yes. Um, if if we get approved by EOHLC, yes. we'll need to have a hearing, I'd say, to amend our rules and regulations um, for site plan review. And I also sent you, Rachel, and you, Claire, mm -hmm. a draft on the change yep. for um, when there's administrative review of signs. So I think we can probably do, do those both. But that does require a public hearing that we'll want to fit in somewhere. And, and the other news is I finished my first draft of what the site plan review Great. could look like. So I'll give you a copy afterward. But Fantastic. it's so different than what you did that I think we're going to have to sit down and reconcile the two. All right. Looking forward to that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Fantastic. Are you send that only to Claire or are you send it to the rest of the Well, board? I want to send it to Claire and have she and I sit down first and go over. That makes sense. Go, Even over, better. go over the changes and why I did some things and sure. why I okay. sort of put some things in that she had but put them in a different place. And okay. when she and I, I think, have a meeting of the minds, then I think we'll send it out to everyone. Send out to a, good, so a good draft. I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay. <laughs> Great. Anything else on the Warren article process or other hearings? All right. Um, next, we'll go to item number six, which is the Arlington Heights Business District. And Claire, 
Great. Thank you. Great. So, you memo on this? at the board's request, I put together a rough timeline um, for outreach and adoption of Arlington Heights Business District. Um, I, the, the thinking of this board and, and of DPCD is that we do need to re-engage with the public um, prior to bringing this to town meeting. And you know, for, for lack of a, a, a fall date, um, this pushes this, us out to 2025. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that we do have, um, you know, it, it, it is, it, it, it is a, a, a quite a bit of time to re-engage with the public, but we already have um, at least a few dates on the um, calendar, um, including um, next week at my um, ACMI update um, that I do um, about once a month. Um, it will include an explanation of the outreach process in this memo um, that I sent to the board in the timeline, as well as a review of the recommendations in the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan, um, which do include consolidation of the business districts into one <coughs> neighborhood business district, um, as well as a few others. Um, I think it's a great idea. It's a, another good reason for us to push this off to 2025, as we don't know if there may be other um, Warren articles or other decisions that need to be made around this. Um, you know, prior to us, you know, just bringing forward the business district, there could be access, you know, uh, ancillary or accessory, um, you know, uh, articles or, or things that come up that we may want to also progress at the same time. Um, so beginning um, on January 15th, I will be doing my um, community meeting uh, media update. Um, I am meeting with the Arlington Heights uh, Business Association um, on January 18th to let them know um, that we are re-engaging in this process and to you know, review uh, where we were in 2019 and see what changes um, have happened um, si uh, since then or if there are uh, other uh, updates that people are looking for or would like to see. Um, I have tentatively scheduled a community meeting from May 9th um, basically to um, solicit the same feedback. Um, we will continue to update and inform uh, neighborhood stakeholders moving forward, um, including any contemplation of changes or updates. Um, you know, folks uh, should probably know if we are um, considering, um, you know, any, anything different. Um, and then in um, early September, when the board comes back into its regular schedule, we will do a report back um, with our with the outcome of <coughs> our outreach, and then we'll take a call to finalize um, that Warren article or any others um, that may uh, come out of that process um, to submit to town meeting um, this time next year. Can I? make a couple of requests Absolutely. to add to the schedule yes um, first of all thank you so much for putting this together I think um, this is a, um, a really great framework for us to, to use for something that um, I, I think it's really important for us to take the time to do in terms of all of the community engagement given how long ago the Arlington Heights neighborhood action plan was put together. There's great information in there, but I think re-engaging the neighborhood is really important. Okay. That's pre-COVID, right? It was pre 2019. It was released. Okay. Um, so a couple of other um, interest groups that I think I'd love to include as part of this process. Um, the Chamber of Commerce was yes. very, very interested in um, this and learning more and hopefully um, engaging um, so that they could make sure that this, um, you know, that they could be supportive of, of the um, the enhancements to future business growth in Arlington Heights. Um, the Arlington Heights Community Association mm -hmm. that J Janet O'Rudin is so um, involved in, I think they have tremendous um, community events. They've just grown and grown and grown in terms of the um, number of residents that they get out for them. They have a right. spring event every year. I think it would be great if we could do a table um, at that event. Um, it would be great since that's really when, right around when we're gonna be it, even a precursor to kicking off if we think we could be ready to, again, um, introduce that to the community ahead of the working community meeting, more just interest and advocacy. And then they did a fall event as well. Great. So that would be great in, I think it was in October this past year, to be able to, you know, come back to the community after all of this engagement yeah. activity in terms of this is what we heard, this is what's being moved forward, let's talk about questions, concerns, et cetera. So I think bookending that with, again, the great community work that's already happening in Arlington Heights I, would be great. No, I appreciate that. Those are, um, those are excellent um, opportunities um, the to other, manage. 
Thank you. The other um, question I have is whether re-engaging the um, Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan Implementation Committee, the longest <laughs> name for a committee ever created in the town of Arlington, um, would, would be a good idea. Those were really sure. engaged um, citizens within the town, um, and um, it would be great to reach out to all those folks and, and make sure that we get them engaged Absolutely. Again. Great. Thank you. Those are great suggestions. Kim. No, I just had one more to add to that. It was sure. The MBTA. Yes. Oh, yes. We were going to talk to the MBTA about that turnaround for the bus. Yes. And we did, and it was Ali. I know. Did a lot of reach out, but but let's re-engage them. I, I want to reach out to them in a different way. Yeah. Um, you know. Welcome to suggestions. We do talk to them periodically about. I one we might go through the like, governor. Or that. <laughs> <laughs> That uh, route. I'll go knock on our door. Uh, yes, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yes, I, uh, I understand. Yeah. That route is 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 a, a much better route to go, I think. Okay. Uh, and then it's two things. One is that turnaround, mm -hmm. and then the bike path mm -hmm. is MBTA property, but they make it so hard to make it inclusive of the mm -hmm. town yeah. if they can free up. Like a zone or an area we can where we can work together. To create a real entrance into Arlington from mm -hmm. Arlington mm -hmm. Heights. From well, any interaction between a bike yeah. path and the town. I mean, mm -hmm. just, it's just like a highway right there, and you know, the only way you get off is on a street. There's no. Yeah. Well, that's that's really good. good. Oh yeah. But those are that's stony. Right. I wouldn't mind adding to a topic somewhere maybe. Isn't there a Greek festival there that happens in? Um, yes. Yes. That uh, happens in, in early the spring. The spring. In May. Can we get a table there? I can certainly, certainly look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just because I know that everybody goes is just for the beer and the gyros and everything else. <laughs> That's it. There's nothing to be happy with. But there's a lot of people that go there from the neighborhood. It's a wonderful community. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean. I love going there, and if we have a table there with some stuff showing and get some uh, people's opinions, that'd be great. Thank you, Ken. Shana. I think that I think the um, bike path and MBTA connections are great idea. Okay, so, super. Jean. Yes, I I agree with all the suggestions. I have a suggestion uh, given separately about how to engage with the team. Oh, okay. Um, and. On this schedule, I think it would be helpful if there's one date between September 9, 2024 and January 2025, where um, um, the, the redevelopment board is reviewing drafts. Okay. Because yep. this is sort of like September, great report back, but then the next thing is the thing is finalized in January. I think we need a, we need a December check-in sure. where we can see a draft. And I guess that also, to your point around seeing a draft, begs the question, is this something that you envision the DPCD taking the lead on? Do we need to put together a subcommittee of the redevelopment board? Um, should this go back to the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Action Plan Implementation Committee? <laughs> I mean, there, there are a number of ways, there's, there's work that needs to be done. Yeah. And the question is, what is the body that will dive into that work? I think at this point, it's uh, DPCD. I would have to get up and re-engage with the public to see you know, which level of interest. If I can get the implementation committee back mm -hmm. together and they're you know, excited to help me, or help, you know, be, be a group, be the group that group was, I, I was part of that group and oh, they were fantastic. really engaged at, at the time okay. that, that they were meeting. So, yeah. Great. Steve. So, yeah, my, I basically had one, uh, well, two questions. One was um, the chair just touched on, but uh, during the period of, say, June to September, um, what role does the board play? Um, and you know, I want you know, in terms of like, is there a, you know, a, a subcommittee working on it? I, I would hope that um, you know, 
we as a board can get periodic updates if there is a subcommittee, sort of like um, periodic meeting, the periodic meetings we had with the FBTA Communities Working Group. Sure. The other thing um, I, you know, maybe suggest considering an outreach budget. Um, yes. You know, postcards turned out to be a useful tool, um, but they're, you know, they're not cheap. No, uh, but they are useful. Yes. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, any other items relative to the business district? Would you take a question for the uh, Sure. We're actually about to head into open forums, so. It's relative to but you can talk about this topic too. So let's just roll right into open forum. Right. Thank you. Just a question. And I'm sorry, if you could just identify name and address for the record, that would be great. Vincent Baudouin at 56 Silk Street. And so relative to the additional timeline and the uh, mobilization that's going to be happening in terms of a public outreach process, I was curious for the board what would be the pros and cons of folding other business districts, such as Capitol Square, into the same process and the same timeline? Great question. So um, <coughs> we have, as a board, discussed whether or not we wanted to look at this as um, something that we engaged in each of the business districts at the same time or sequentially. And so what the board had identified, certainly engage with those groups to keep them abreast of what's happening. Um, but the um, thought was to each of the business districts have such unique um, challenges and opportunities was to address them one at a time. So um, the thought was to start with Arlington Heights, then move into to, um, East Arlington following the, the work that's, that's been done in the Heights. Um, but absolutely, I think it's a great suggestion to, you know, let the um, Capitol Square and um, East Arlington business community know what is uh, going on as we uh, work through this this process with the Heights, because that would be the next group that we'd move into for the following year. Correct. It's really less of a suggestion and more of a question of, as to whether there would be some advantages or some things that could be starting to happen at the same time, even if they're not on the exact same time. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Okay. Yes. Should I stay here? Or move up? Why don't you move up? Okay. I heard that the microphone picks up better in the first couple of rows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street or Green Streets, Arlington. And I'm following up on, I was here uh, your mid-December meeting with a uh, proposal for uh, changing the zoning on parking uh, trees and parking lots and landscaping in parking lots. Um, since then, we've been working with uh, Gene Benson on scaling back our proposal. Our proposal was to have all parking lots uh, constructed or reconstructed uh, contain 50% shade, uh, tr mostly from trees, but solar panels would be okay. And there was an objection um, in certainly in terms of the size that that would really in, uh, hinder construction of multifamily buildings and so on to have to make the parking lots bigger to accommodate the tree canopy cover. And so um, in uh, consulting with Gene, we, we changed it to, um, it would be a amendment to uh, section 11. Uh, uh, no, excuse me, 6.1, 6.11.1. 6, 611. 6.1. There is no 6.11 There is 6.11. Six, uh, six uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared after sitting here for three hours. But anyway. Um, Imagine how we're feeling. <laughs> uh, I, my apologies. 6.1.11, uh, and I think that is section D6. Um, yes, that's what it is. And that talks about parking spaces providing, excuse me, parking areas providing more than 25 spaces shall include landscaped areas and at least 8% of the total paved portion of the parking area. Our proposal would change that to 50%. Um, 
and it would be uh, trees, but it could be solar panels or, you know, before the trees are big enough, it could to create 50% shade. Um, they could be shade structures. So th that would be our proposals. That would uh, take into account most of the larger parking areas in town. Um, and it would, it would leave alone the smaller parking areas that are attached to, to uh, residential buildings. So um, we do feel that we are in a climate emergency. We need to be taking all the steps we can to mitigate the effects of climate change. And certainly heat in an urban area like ours is huge. It's only going to get worse. And if there's any measures we can take, to protect our residents from extreme heat, um, which you have in parking lots that are unprotected um, from um, the sun, and then they get hotter and then they heat up the whole area, um, which causes heat-related illnesses, and um, of course it, uses, it causes higher air conditioning costs, which then is more greenhouse gases, and there's a lot of, a lot of other reasons. But so. Um, and we certainly have taken um, a lot of other steps in town to mitigate the effects of climate change. We just passed the specialized trench code that requires um, extreme energy efficiency in uh, multifamily housing. Um, and uh, and now we and um, electric wire in uh, all residential construction. And um, there are many others here that I know David Morgan could ask me to help me with if he were here. But um, anyway, this is consistent with where Arlington is going, being a leader on uh, uh, having rules that help with the effects of climate change. And the idea of, um, there was discussion at the lab, and I, so I would hope that you would help us develop this particular warrant article and would end up uh, supporting it. And I do feel it's right in the wheelhouse also of what we do ask developers to do on private property. Um, we ask them to, we regulate the sizes of their sound, the signs and, and the brightness of their lights and how many um, parking spaces they should or could have. And, and their turning ratios, and uh, we already require landscaping. So we already have a lot of rules. Um, so I would hope that the board would consider this, and, and I just want to tell you that that this is where we're going with this, that we're with the, um, the 25 spaces, and we would like to continue to work with Jean on hopefully putting something together, and we'll bring it back to you probably your next meeting. Great. Thank you if, very if much for the update. Like us to do that. Richard, have one, one, one Please, go Yep. Uh, what's the threshold you guys are trying to establish to make this happen? Okay, so let's say there's an existing parking lot. I'll uh, just uh, pick an example. Mm -hmm. The Walgreens right on Mass Ave next to the gas station. But, yes. uh, okay? Yeah. That's a pretty big uh, parking it lot. It's a pretty big heat island, okay? Yes. Now, if I was the owner there and I said uh, parts of the parking lot is starting to crumble, but I need to patch it up, does this affect that then? Or if I'm just re-striping and recovering it with some, because uh, it's it, from regular maintenance, or is it uh, when I mill it down and repave it, then it counts? What's uh, I'm, uh, I, 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 you had it before? Did that change? Before you had before you had to mill it down to put new yes. pavement. Yes. Okay? No, no, we weren't. No, we weren't going. We weren't going to change anything except for the size of parking lots that would apply to. So, 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 if, if they wanted to repair the their parking lot, it wouldn't. It would not affect this. This zoning change would not affect them. I don't think so. I, just a repair. I think a complete repaving would be considered a reconstruction of the lot. I think that was. I, I just want you to be. When you state this, be clear about this. Sure. So if it's yes, because part of maintenance is every so often you retar you retop the whole lot and then restripe it just because you know, it's asphalt. The stuff just wears off. 
Well, I think these are really good questions. It's something we have to look at. I don't really know what it, reconstruction versus repaving. Gene? I, I, this was the same question I asked them, and, and they have to work on this. They don't have to know it to file the warrant article. Mm -hmm. They yeah. have to know it to file the main motion. Right. No, they have to know it for me to get them support. Well, right, yes. which is which is which the main motion. Okay. Which right. is the main motion. Okay. Right. Yes. They will have to know it yes. by late March. Yeah. No, we'll, we're just going to go ahead and file the warrant article, um, but we want to keep the communication with you because it would be so great to have your support for the main motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks again. Any other um, members of the public wishing to speak today? All right, with that, we'll close open forum and move to new business. Claire, is there anything that you have to share with the board for new business? No new business at this time. Great. Anyone else from the board? Steve. So I uh, want to talk a little bit about my, my lunchtime, my latest lunchtime reading, okay. uh, which is uh, material related to Boston <laughs> Squares and Streets Zoning Initiative. So this is sort of their effort to, you know, their first step in trying to modernize their zoning code. And there were two, um, there were two things um, that I came across that I thought were, were interesting and that might, we might want to consider at some point. So sometimes we've, um, or perhaps me more than maybe some of my colleagues, have been torn by the, 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 the words open space and the different ways, <laughs> and the ways we use those same words to mean different things in different parts of our bylaw. Um, the boss, Boston's draft zoning, draft zoning has a, they use a little bit of a different verbiage. For private outdoor space that's open to the sky, but accessible to members of the public, they will call it uh, public open space. But other portions of the parcel that are not accessible to the public, they refer to this as amenity space. Mm -hmm. This could be a backyard, this could be a balcony, this could be a rooftop. I just thought it was a nice framing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is, um, with MBTA communities, we tried to um, you know, come, up, come up with a list of active uses for ground floor. Um, this, is, this sort of thing is very much at the center of what they seem to be trying to do, and their use table has a whole section called active uses. Um, so anyway, those are... That's great. Yeah, and just some of the dimensional regulations, like uh, they include things like floor plate size, so you don't end mm -hmm. up with too large of a building on, on a single parcel, and um, things like uh, the length of unarticulated facades, which we kind of mm, do. We have some bit. of that, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an inch, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a zoning by, it's a, it's a zoning ordinance, so it's dry reading, but it's an interesting dry read. Great. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right. Um, with that, I think that takes us to uh, see if there's a motion to adjourn. So motion. Second. Okay. All right. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Jean. Yes. Gina. Yes. Kim. Yes. And a yes as well. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.